Um, we are delighted to have Catherine Tucker join us. Um, among other things, uh, she has been extremely actively engaged, not just on the academic side, where she's been working with NBER and a number of other organizations, but for example, with the Federal Trade Commission and actual implementation of policy. She was the member of the scientific committee of the last microeconomics conference, which they do regularly, perhaps even more of them. I was just uh, focusing on that. And it's really lovely that I saw at the end of that, there was a tweet that, that said, um, exceptional keynote address by Catherine Tucker to end the first day of the conference. Not to put any pressure on you. <laughs> but um, I'm delighted, actually, this is the second time uh, CTIC has been uh, fortunate to grace, uh, to have Catherine grace our program. Uh, she also participated in a program we organized in China some years ago, pre-COVID, so it seems like an eternity, uh, where my wife watched your recently born child who is not with you this time, uh, but is now starting kindergarten. Use. So this is all very exciting. It's amazing how all time flies. But it's to say that uh, she is an old friend of CTICs, and we couldn't imagine someone better uh, to have here welcoming us. And the, the topic is, to me, the standard is uh, bridging from uh, abstract economics into actual things like antitrust and exclusion. So I think this is a very welcome uh, uh, opportunity to have her speak. Uh, and uh, we take it away, Catherine, without further ado. Wonderful. Oh, ah. Isn't it wonderful when people keep us in order? Um, great. So um, I've just had one of those mornings. You know those mornings where you get to your plane, your plane's delayed, you get on it, and then they said, we're just fixing some mechanical difficulties, but hopefully we'll be underway soon. And you have that sort of dual mode, like, do I want them to fix the difficulties? Do I want to take off on this plane or not? Right. <laughs> but the plane, <laughs> I stood I stood throughout, and uh, I am here. So that's, uh, you know, let's keep hoping that my, my luck um, keeps going. So with that said, um, I am going to tell you about my plan for the keynote. So when you're asked to give a keynote at a law school, especially by Chris, you sort of feel a bit of a duty to talk about sort of digital economy and competition issues, so I'm going to do my duty. Yeah. But then, having done my duty, I will then tell you what <laughs> I've been doing for the last five years. Well, my baby has gone from being completely inert to being a kindergartner, and tell you what I've been doing over the last five years, and uh, which has all been about AI and exclusion. So that's going to be the plan for the keynote. Now, um, I also want to give a health warning. You know, I walked into this room. I don't know what everyone's, who everyone is online, but I walked into this room and I saw a lot of serious economists looking at me in that serious economist way. And I did want to have a health warning for you, which is that what I'm going to be doing is summarizing a paper, which in turn summarizes paper this, that I have written for economists for a legal audience. So with that health warning, and you'll notice, economists, I changed my Beamer slides to look almost business school uh, to be keynote -y. So that should be your first uh, indication that it's not going to be too much technical stuff here. Now, when we sort of think about platforms, digital services, and antitrust, I think it's fair to say that economists have been playing from the same um, the same recipe book for many years. And you know, even if we sort of go back to 2000, we were obsessed during the Microsoft case with uh, questions of network effects and switching costs. I think it's fair enough to say that maybe around 2015 we added data, or big data as we called it, to that playbook in terms of your sort of checklist as an academic economist about what, what you think might shape competition or a lack of competition in these markets. Now, I'm going to try and persuade you that this is a somewhat outdated view in a sort of very brave way. Um, and, you know, let me summarize why you know, I take this rather strident viewpoint. Um, first of all, you know, since I did my P 
PhD back in economics as a sort of a, a grad, as my grad student, I've managed to write a lot of papers about network effects. And you know, despite what I've always set out to do, every single one of these papers has sort of shown that network effects are actually a lot more fragile than you might think. And what do I mean by that? You know, I've established that network effects tend to be very localized. Um, we don't, you know, we've always, for convenience, modeled a network as a function of n, or the number of nodes in it. But actually, instead, we should think of it as being a lot more local and dependent on activity. You know, I've also shown that actually network effects can be a highly destabilizing force, in that even if you have them, uh, the problem is because network effects are ultimately a very sort of social you know, phenomena, um, you can actually accidentally often end up uh, off-putting your, uh, having off-putting people within your platform in a way which actually means your network effects are again not a function of NEN and that network effects can be unstable. So that's sort of what I've been writing and in general if I was to sort of summarize where I've always ended up with this is that we're, you know, we're excited about network effects but because of this localness, um, because they sometimes be negative, you know, in general, even if you don't have that localness or negativity, I would always argue they're going to be fair child without switching costs. In other words, we might sort of have a model as an economist about competition where we want to think about it as a function of network effects. But I encourage, you know, I, I have taken the perspective that really it still comes back to switching costs to think about whether or not network effects are important. And for this, I just sort of want to give an example of what I mean. Now, this is a screenshot of one of my favorite old slides I used to use in the classroom. And this was where I would start, you know how you have to, when you're teaching MBA students, you have to have examples of everything. And so I had to come up with an example of an instance where switching costs mattered. And you can imagine them sort of interacting with network effects. And my favorite example was always iTunes. And why is that? Well, it's difficult to remember, but back in the day, we actually had this counter example in iTunes where Amazon entered the market and reduced prices of all MP3s by 50%, right? Sort of killer competition. What happened? Absolutely nothing. No one used Amazon whatsoever. And why was that? Well, I would argue it was the switching costs. I don't know if you remember when we used to have MP3s, but the idea of having M different MP3s on different places, on different platforms, you couldn't have a proper playlist, right? It would be really, really inconvenient. And so I always thought this was sort of a killer example of a switching cost. But then, as you know, uh, MBA, MBA slides start to date rather quickly. In that my killer example got killed itself uh, rather quickly by Spotify. And what I learned from that is in a cloud, you know, first of all, obviously a cloud-based environment is gonna reduce a lot of what we think of as switching costs. We use the model as switching costs in terms of hardware. But also one of the dynamics of platform, platform competition is always going to be that the moment you have switching costs, which are allowing you to, um, in some sense, extract value from your network effects, is the moment that some firm is gonna try and invent some technology to undo. Now, you know, in terms of, so I've gone through network effects, you know, they're fragile, switching costs, well, you know, in today's environment, it's really hard to retain them because your competitors are always going to be going after them. I guess the last sort of, of the moment of the traditional toolkit is going to be surrounding data. And, you know, for that, um, I don't, I think we can all remember back in 2015, 16, where every single person, I'm sure Chris, you had one too, wrote a paper called Big Data and Competition. 
And what we did, you know, what I've always thought about that is, you know, number one, there's been a lack of articulation about really what we mean by data. And also a lack of sort of combating issues of diminishing returns of data. But, you know, what I think we've sort of, what I've found at least in my own research, which I'll show you a screenshot of here, is that you sort of have to be quite careful with assertions about how data is going to create a barrier to entry. And this paper, what I looked at was what happened when in the EU, they cut data retention periods for certain search engines. And then I see, well, if you start to force search engines to store less panel data, how does that affect outcomes? And so that was the question, sort of traditional sort of natural experiment. You might notice that you've never seen this paper. Do you know why? Because there are completely nothing, right? We'd have a diff and diff with nothing. The bars just didn't change, you know, however you looked at it, there was absolutely no effect of these regulations or this reduction in time period on search quality, which I was measuring by whether or not the person went on to do a subsequent search or seemed to be satisfied with that search. Now, we all know sort of like the bias of publishing results in economics, you're never ever going to get published if you don't find anything. But for me, it always sort of shows, you know, that really we make these big statements about how data may be a barrier to entry, but we have to be really sort of careful articulating what might draw this. And in this case, you know, just having a long period of data doesn't really help you in a search engine world where the real question is sort of relevancy and speed. Now, this is where I get even more business school, which is where I argue that in some sense, um, again, if I was to have my list of things that people interested who are economists or the intersection between law, competition and economics, what they should be in some sense looking at is I always think we do a good job in looking at our strategy professors in business schools. And why is that? Well, if you think about it, what do strategy professors do all the time, as far as I understand, in the MBA classroom? They spend most of their time trying to tell students how to create barriers to entry, right? That's their job. And so if we sort of reverse engineer what our strategy colleagues are telling us, then, you know, we actually learn something. And so for this, I'm going to return to what actually strategy professors are teaching their students about um, platforms and platform economics. And I have the wonderful privilege of co-teaching a class on platforms with a strategy professor named Pierre Azoulay. And he introduced me to this strategy term called Corin. And, you know, I was like, what is that? When he started talking about it. But I actually learned a great deal from him. And what Corin is is it's basically an idea which was pioneered at MIT by our associate dean, Michael Kuzumane, which is the idea that the way you get to be a platform leader is by making sure you put yourself front and center in controlling interactions over your platform. Now, the way I explain it as an economist is really what Michael was saying in that article is that, again, in economic models, we often measure the attractiveness of a platform through simply a model of network effects, which are a function of the number of nodes. But, you know, that's really not how platforms are creating value in 2023. Instead, it's not just the presence of users. Instead, value is created by managing those interactions. And it took me about three years to work this out, but I think this is what they're trying to say in Amex when they make this distinction between a transaction platform and a non-transaction platform. This idea that what is different about, a, say, a digital advertising platform is that in those advertising, uh, in those efforts of advertising, the platform is helping with measurement, 
um, helping automate everything, basically providing a whole lot of metrics and analysis, which makes sure that appetite interactions between advertisers and users go well. And that contrasts with the clue that we were given in Amex about what on earth they might mean when they said the word transaction platform, which was that it was definitely not a newspaper. Where if you think about a newspaper, there's no real management of interactions. There's no attempt to extract value because no one can observe anything in terms of when I get a newspaper, whether or not I read it, if I take subsequent action, and so on. So let me just give you an example of how we tend to teach about coring. Um, in our MBA classes, in that what we do is we tend to talk in terms of, you know, quite traditional ideas, in terms of reductions of cost. So if we think about Airbnb, how is Airbnb creating value? It's not simply because it has a large number of rentals and a large number of potential, pe potential people looking for short-term stays. The way it's really creating value from that install base is by reducing search costs so that if, for example, I'm busy looking for an apartment in Melbourne, it's actually going to be very easy to use criteria to try and quickly search and find the right apartment for me due to the interface. That's going to make the install base far more valuable for me as a user. Second, not only is it going to be easy to find an apartment, but it's also going to be easy for me to assess its quality. Again, if you think about what digital platforms, especially matchmaking platforms, are doing a lot of times, is they're both thinking about curation and they're thinking about how to add quality information, in this case, in the terms of reviews. And I guess the last thing I always emphasize when I teach is that the other way you're really creating value from the platform is slightly counterintuitive, in that often you're acting as a policeman trying to rule out, back, uh, read out bad actors, bad interactions. And that's another way you're really creating value for your install base. Now, the reason I think this is important is, again, if we're modeling platform competition, we probably need to not just be thinking in terms of, well, how many users on each side of the platform do we have? Um, but instead, we should really be thinking about, well, what sort of coring efforts are taking place, <clears throat> which might allow us to unleash the value of those network effects. And I think that's an important way of modeling competition. Now, the other thing I want to say, which will delight the lawyers in the room, or not delight them, but at least say words that they like, <laughs> is to say that this actually has implications. Because I sometimes think, you know, that lawyers, when they think about economists, they're like, well, what do they do? Market definition. So you're sort of fitting into that lane. And so, uh, you know, I think it's important when we're trying to think about market definition. And so let me explain what I mean by this. Um, you know, what am I, what is the picture I'm showing you? Well, this is coming from actually when I teach platforms. And I always give my students the challenge of working out whether a fish market in Auckland is a platform. And clue, yes it is, right? You're bringing together fishermen, you're bringing together people who want to buy fish. But I was thinking, you know, they always like start complaining at me about my fish market example, saying, no, 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 platforms have to be digital. Um, and then I give them the bad news that they've just got stereotypes about <laughs> about fish markets in Auckland, and actually they look like this. Um, it's a very sophisticated thing run by a Dutch auction. And in particular, there's a certain um, technology which lies in the, big, the center of the fish market, which is this Dutch auction sort of um, device which displays it in real time. And this is why I think market definition becomes important, or why this relates to market definition. Um, we can imagine you know, obviously, having this big clock in the middle displaying the results of the Dutch auction, you know, that's obviously a coin technology. It's making sure this Dutch auction works, works well, providing a lot of information. But we can imagine a world where you could get confused and you could start saying, ooh, maybe that's the market. The market here is in the provision of Dutch auction visual devices. In other words, you're conflating what is really the market here, which is the matchmaking of fishermen and people who want to buy fish, 
with the coring technology which exists in the middle of that interface. And you know, my comment is, is that if you look at a lot of the antitrust cases which are happening right now, um, you know, I think some of this sort of, we're still trying to work this out, right? How do we think about coring technologies when we have two-sided markets? Should we define them as a market or should we treat them as something else? All right, so Chris, I have now spent uh, 20 minutes being a good keynote speaker and talked about platform competition and basically made the argument that, you know, we've had our playbook for a long time, but network effects are pretty fragile, switching costs are less important, I would argue, in a cloud-based uh, IT environment. And, you know, we're not often clear enough about what enough data may be doing to competition. You know, so instead maybe we should learn a lesson from our strategy professor brethren and really think about coring as it appears to be the main way that platforms are actually competing. Okay. Would you be willing to take a question? Oh, gosh, yes, because, you know, because, like, otherwise, please. So um, I think, Rakesh, you've noticed that I could just go on forever, couldn't I? No, no. And I'm still traumatized by the plane, so you should interrupt so, me, please. So would you be willing to accept an alternative to coring, because I'm reluctant to give credit to our management colleagues? So if I'm, if I'm running a platform, I'm really running a market, and therefore one of my obligations is to make the market as efficient as possible, in other words, kill off adverse selection, reduce search costs, and so coring is simply make your market more efficient. You know what? You are really unleashing your inner Liran Einav. Because he, um, so if anyone knows, Liran, uh, professor at Stanford, he's a sort of like very, he likes shouting at people. Um, oh gosh, I'm live, I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, but he, you know, he's my advisor, so maybe I can say that. But when he saw me arguing about competition, he's like, why do business school professors feel the name to sort of like rename everything, right? In the end, what you're doing is minimizing costs in the middle of interactions. Why do you just say that rather than giving it a fancy name? So I, you know, I, agree, I agree with that. Um, however, I must admit, Chris will correct me if I'm wrong, sometimes a legal audience loves a phrase. <laughs> um, and you know, might find our sort of commonplace economics language of efficiency by reducing costs slightly less exciting. Right, but, but then, uh, but, but then it seems like a follow-on implication is that if I'm managing a platform and my comparative advantage comes from the fact that I'm able to make my marketplace more efficient than yours, suddenly it's not obvious that there's an antitrust concern here, right? Well, I mean, I think Again, it's difficult without sort of a specific instance, right, that we're thinking of. But, you know, if we're thinking about, let me give you an example about why I think it's troubling, right? So let's imagine a sort of potential platform where because of the need to, you know, say reduce adverse selection, I decide to exclude certain players that I don't think are desirable. Maybe I could have these sort of, I don't know, I'm a, um, maybe if I'm, I don't know, iOS or something, and I say, you know, there are all these rules you have to jump through to make this look great. Now, again, I'm not a law professor, but to some people that could almost sound like exclusionary conduct, right? Rather than, as we might think of it, reducing adverse selection. And so I think that's, that's sort of why it's important to lay this out so that we have a better way of, I guess, assessing conduct within a platform context. Any other questions? If not, okay, bad luck. We're getting on to what I've done for the last five years. And what, uh, let me tell you my sort of journey. Um, so my journey, um, I've always been mainly a research user thought about privacy. And I was at the FTC Privacy Con, as they like to call their privacy conference. And I was presenting, you know, some of my more typical work, which is about the privacy paradox, which was all about the fact that 
you know, generally MIT students behaved in accordance with their stated preference when it came to privacy. If you asked them to share the emails of their friends, they would just make up email addresses with expletives in them. However, in this paper, what we showed is that though they seem to be behaving in accordance with their privacy preferences, uh, or the stated ones, the moment you gave them pizza was the moment that they shifted completely and that they started just giving us all their friends' email addresses. And we always thought this was sort of quite a nice uh, explanation of what is called the privacy paradox or the divergence between stated and revealed preferences. So I was standing at the FTC giving this speech, and then I realized that no one else was giving at all on topic. It may have been called PrivacyCon, but it was very clear to me that privacy was no longer uh, the topic of the day. And instead, every single person who was not me's uh, paper was about something called algorithmic bias. And what is algorithmic bias? Well, a classic example of it, which I think I got actually from this FTC presentation, is that if you search on LinkedIn for Stephanie Williams, LinkedIn tells you, hopefully, no, 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 you can't have meant to search for a woman in a professional context. You must have met Stephen. And, you know, there's been a variety of explanations provided in this. Some of it has been, um, you know, some of it has been sort of biased programmers. But I think most of the explanations have really faced on the idea of sort of biased training data in that, you know, if enough people in the past have corrected themselves to wanting Stephen, the algorithm could uh, unfortunately uh, pick that up. And so, you know, this, this was good. Um, and I found that interesting, but of course, you know, I decided that, you know, I was, I was sort of thinking about the general explanations, which were all based on picking up stuff in the training data. And what I thought was thinking was, well, are there other reasons that algorithms might act in a way which appears to be biased? And I'm going to call what I've been working on something called algorithmic exclusion, which is not when um, algorithms are because the data that's feeding them reflects a societal bias, but instead they are because data is simply missing due to differences in privilege. And I'll give you some ideas about why this comes out because of either data sparsity or lack of data or just data fragmentation. And that's really what I've been working on in terms of, um, of, of trying to understand or add to this algorithmic bias debate. Now, you know, I, even though I have my very keynote slides, I still managed a little equation, um, though it's slightly, you know, ridiculously easy. And to sort of explain what I mean and what is distinct from what I, I've been doing and the traditional algorithm bias um, uh, literature, which is if you think about the algorithmic bias literature, it has really been focused on the beta in predictions. And it has been focused on the idea that when we estimate that beta, that beta could come up with a prediction which reflects a societal bias that we feel uncomfortable with. What I'm going to be talking about instead is when Y is problematic because we're missing X. In that you're trying to run the regression and X just doesn't exist in the right way. In other words, I'm going to be focusing on the data rather than the estimation. So let me tell you a little bit more about why data can be missing. And then I'll get, you know, I'll have these illustrative examples and then tell you exactly how I fed through to a search paper. So in terms of illustrative examples, one of my favorites of this comes from Boston. And um, in Boston, um, someone, we have a lot of potholes, we have bad weather, uh, decided the best way to try and deal with our pothole problem was to have a mobile app, which you could have running in the background 
and would pick <coughs> up when you're driving along whether or not your car went bumpity bump. Um, and that was the plan, and the idea was it would really increase efficiency, right? And that you'd find exactly where the, um, uh, where the bubbles are. You know, now, you know, when I describe this to you, uh, we can sort of all imagine what problems this is going to create. In that, where do you think they found the potholes? Was it in Dorchester, Roxbury? the poor neighborhoods in Boston? No, no, of course not. Instead, they found every single pothole that could possibly exist in Beacon Hill, which if you don't know where Beacon Hill is, it's just where rich people live. And why is that? Well, it's because, think about this app. It's sort of designed for rich people, right? I mean, you know, you've obviously got to have the knowledge to download it, but you also have to have sort of an unlimited data plan and the decision to use it and run it in the background. And so as a result, they have an entire plot hole problem, um, prediction uh, mechanism based on just getting data from rich people. Um, you know, so what I sort of generalize this out to say is that in general, when we're thinking about the data that fuels money algorithms, it's also, it's often gonna just reflect the privilege. In that, if we think about every single person on this room, then, you know, what do we spend all our time doing? Basically, just creating digital data about ourselves, right? We spend all our time on the computer. Um, we're often switching devices. We probably have unlimited data plans. We use our cell phones a lot. We probably have fancy homes, so with lots of Internet of Things style of devices. In other words, so much of our data is going to be out there and being used by algorithms for predicting. But it's going to be a reflection of our privilege to have that interaction with digital devices rather than anything else. Now, what I want to do then is sort of bring up another, this other concept, again, uh, to slightly annoy Rakesh, because I think he doesn't like me renaming things in a fancy way. But again, I've learned, having been to DC a few times, that you have to rename stuff somewhat to get attraction, attention. And, you know, what I, what I want to sort of popularize here is, you know, we often have very important concerns about privacy, but perhaps the opposite of that is the idea of a data desert, right? That because differences of privilege lead to different patterns of creation of data, um, we may end up introducing bias into our world of machine learning and predictions because some people just don't have data which is going to be fooling the algorithm. Now, the other reason that I've identified why algorithmic exclusion happens is really, really nerdy. That's the good news. Okay. So I'm looking around the room, and I'm trying to see empirical friends. And I'm looking for empirical friends, and I see a lot of incredibly accomplished theorists. So let's just... <laughs> Let me tell you about my life, <laughs> theoretical friends. Um, you know, when you're using data um, and you are a PhD student or, you know, even a, you know, tenure professor, actually what you spend a lot of your time doing is around data hygiene and trying to match together databases. If you remember back to when you got wise to not doing any empirical work and, and just and went all pen and paper, and you had to do exercises to do with data, you'll probably remember that was something called a merge function in Stata. And if you've ever used it, you'll just know what a nightmare it is, right? The moment you try and merge two data sets is the moment that everything goes wrong, right? And you're, you're probably not going to notice your mistakes the first time. You'll go back and fix them, and then there'll be second, third, fourth, fifth layer of mistakes. Now, the reason this is important from our own experience is that, let's be clear, most of the data economy isn't just coming from one data source, instead it's coming from matching disparate data sources about people. And therefore, you have to have a way of matching. Now, again, if you've ever done matching or that join by function, merge function in, in state, or you know, or if you're uh, more recently trained, You'll know what this, what, you know the moment you try and match on anything which is alpha numeric, 
is the moment you're basically done for, right? You know, no, it's very, very hard, you know, even for fuzzy matching to really, uh, to do matching. Uh, you know, therefore, you know, matching on something like a cell phone or an email address, which is pretty stable, is going to be relatively straightforward. Now, the reason this is important is I've just told you that there are some, going to be some keys or um, consistent identifiers in any panel data set which are easier to match on than others. And so they tend to be very, very broadly used in the data economy which are cell phones and email addresses. And then I want you to think to yourself, well, who's likely to have the most stable email address and the most stable telephone number? Now, Chris, I've known you for many years. In the, that time, your email address has not changed. Cell phone number changed? Bah, bah, right? You know, and in some sense, again, because I, I haven't picked on Chris enough, you know, why is that? It's because he's incredibly privileged, right? We've got stable, we work in a stable economic environment with great job security. And so as a result, things just aren't changing about us. Um, in other words, these identifiers which we're using to match data about people and bring together about people are going to be very stable. Now, the reason these sort of two phenomena are important, I'm now going to show you some actual data. And this comes from some work I've been doing with uh, Nico Neumann. And um, you may not have had the privilege of meeting him, but he's a Martin professor at Melbourne Business School. And we've spent the last five years basically looking at the world of data brokers. Now, you know, I would argue that, you know, given we've got a title of digital services, data brokers are a really important part of the digital economy. Let me just remind you what data brokers do. Basically, they're hoovering up information about each individual. That would include, you know, the way you're playing on games, maybe something on social media, maybe your credit card history, publicly available information, certainly. You know, there's going to be property records, voting records that they're going to be hoovering up. And then they're going to make some predictions about you based on that data. And we're going to be assessing, and what we've been doing is we've been basically assessing, well, how good are data brokers at making these predictions? And then, as I'm going to show you, our most recent work has been focused on showing how this can lead, or the errors in this process can lead to algorithmic exclusion. Now, what really surprised me about data brokers when I started off in this world is that I had thought, you know, I, t I teach marketing, um, and, you know, I always thought that we're in the new data economy, advertisers were doing amazing things with data and sort of buying, like, things like, you know, the prediction that I would be buying, you know, a new minivan in the next six weeks or something. That's what I thought they were doing. That's not what they're actually doing. Most of the time, when advertisers are buying data about people, they're buying really prosaic data. They're buying data about your age and gender. So nothing's sort of different. Why do they do that? Well, the reason they do that is on TV, you know people's age and gender. So if you're trying to do a cross-media campaign, you want to match up what data is available for TV. And so, again, you focus on age and gender. Now, how is it that data brokers are sort of thinking about age and gender? Well, a lot of times what they're really doing is they're using data on your browsing behavior to try and get some clues. And so if you think about it, if I'm a woman, maybe they can sort of predict that if I, for some reason, decide to browse a sanitary product website. Uh, maybe they can predict, uh, you know, my age if I start to look for retirement homes. But what I want you to notice is that retirement homes, well, I could be browsing them for me, my parents, my grandparents. In other words, these signals are not incredibly informative. And what I'm going to argue is we have a very, and I want you to sort of prepare yourself for the results of this, is the reason we're going to find such strange things is that we're in this weird world where some of the most popular data which are supplied by data brokers is actually data which is really hard to predict. Really, really hard to predict. It's a hard prediction task. 
So in our first paper, we just went and said, how good are they at it? Um, and then, you know, uh, I'll just give you one study from that paper, which is where we went and asked data brokers uh, to tell us whether a cookie represented a man and a certain age band. That was just their job. And then we assessed to see how well they did. Um, and how did we know what the truth was? We knew what the truth was because we recruited 30,000 people uh, who actually told us what age and gender they were and then agreed to be tracked. Now you might say that's really, really weird, weird people. Who would ever agree to being tracked? And I agree, these are probably not a representative sample. But what I would argue is that these people should be the easiest people on the internet to profile, right? We've just made it really easy for everyone. They're not using Tor. They are not using cookie blockers. They're not using any of this kind of stuff. Instead, they've just made it easy. Okay, so that's going to be my argument. Yes, it's not representative, but at least we've made the task easy. Um, so how did data brokers do at this allegedly easy task? Um, each row here is a data broker. And the second column is out of 30,000 people, how many of them the data broker said they had data on. And then the third column is the percentage gender accuracy. I want you to see two things about this. The first thing is, if you average out gender accuracy, <laughs> I love the fact the theorists actually have a challenge now. They're like, yeah, no, they've already done it, I think. But you're going to come to very close to 50%. And when you think about it, that is quite funny, right? That they get gender right on the internet 50% of the time. Um, the other thing I want you to notice for sort of more competition law people is just that, you know, we've got a lot of arguments about, you know, and I was referring to them, that somehow data is going to give you greater advantages in our sort of AI for your world. Um, you know, what I want you to take from this is that, you know, then try and do a mental correlation by how much data these data brokers thought they had versus how accurate they were. Again, it's one of those regressions you can run with absolutely nothing, right? There's absolutely no correlation between how much data you have and how bad you are at it. All right, so that's what we did. Um, but then, you know, we, we weren't so, you know, that was interesting. But what we wanted to know was we really wanted to know, given that we establish here the predictions about people are often surprisingly bad in our data economy. What does this mean in terms of what I was just talking about, which is algorithmic exclusion? You know, is it the case that we tend to see poorer predictions for those who are less privileged? And this is what we found. We found that if you're rich, you've got a high income. Um, if you have more than a college degree, if you own your own home, it is almost certainly you're going to be profiled far more accurately. Um, in other words, you know, Chris might have been feeling great about, you know, me saying he was very privileged, but I've just told him that the data broker is going to have far more accurate predictions about him. Um, and what's more, we found that tended to be particularly true about demographic information. And we took this actually as indication that it's put maybe, you know, you can never really say one or the other, but maybe this sort of fragmentation story, this idea that it's very hard to match data about people if they don't have a stable cell phone number or a stable email address, Maybe that's explaining a lot of what's going on. In that, if you think where what's going to really improve demographic information, it's probably going to be like being able to match a name to a cell cell phone number, um, because then at least you can infer some kind of gender, for example, from the name. All right. So let me tell you, we did all of that, and then we were trying to get this published. Again, because being a, you know, we're not in a law school. Our publication, you know, we, you, you know, we have a different, very different publication process. We were trying to get this published, and it was incredibly important for poor Nico. He's up for tenure, 
And then we had one of those things that happened to us in the second round, which was like, that's all fine, but you need more, more, not enough. <laughs> you know, poor Nico. I mean, he spent three months of his summer as an assistant professor getting this data, so it was heartbreaking for him. He was like, oh, it's terrible. So um, then with this more, um, what we had to do was we then tried to think, well, okay, they're objecting that maybe we're being a bit too like our previous prep paper and that we're talking a lot about accuracy. And so then we thought, well, what would also be interesting is to look at coverage. In that, if you remember back to that graph I just showed you, I showed you that actually out of these 30,000 people, a lot of people aren't being covered. And we said, well, who is it in the economy who is more likely to have a profile actually about them? Where's, where's there gonna actually be data? And then we redid it, you know what, we found exactly the same patterns. In that not only if you're rich, well educated, and you're at home, are you more likely to be profiled accurately, but the data is just more likely to exist about you. So we thought that was great. We submitted it. And then, of course, it came back. And they said, oh, still not enough. And so at that point, we were like, okay, what can we do? Uh, they were like, you know, still not enough. How does this generalize, et cetera, et cetera, as usually happens. And so then what we did was we teamed up with another set of researchers. And I want to give this set of researchers all the credit for what we did there. In that, as you might have gathered, Nico and I had incredibly grandiose ambitions in what we were doing, and we were recruiting all these people. Nico was working months at tech firms and so on. But our co-authors had the brilliance of computer scientists to come up with a very simple methodology for basically answering the same question. And that what they did was they took North Carolina voter records. Now, I don't think we've got anyone from North Carolina here today, but one of the strangest things I've ever heard of about North Carolina is that if you're a registered voter, all your data's public. They actually just put it out there. I think it's in their laws. And not only is the data public about you, but <laughs> it's not just your name and address, it's also your race and your gender and your age. So basically, for some reason, North Carolina puts all these voter records out there with age, um, and in particular, they're going to have a race, which we're gonna be, um, an age, which we're gonna be exploiting this research. And so then one of our really clever computer scientists, New Corfus did, is that they took, uh, they took these voter records from North Carolina and then they uploaded them to the API of a data broker, a major data broker, and they said, um, please tell me this person's age. So they gave him name and address and said, please give us age. And gosh, that's interesting, right? I mean, think about how easy in theory this task should be. Literally, the data is out there on the internet, giving you all the answers you need to know. It's mandated by law that that data is out there. Uh, fast, furthermore, this data broker explicitly promised they were going to use public records, right, to make predictions. So we're asking them to make a prediction about something where they got a perfect prediction in, uh, in, uh, in public data. And what we're going to be measuring is whether or not they got the age correct of the person. And then we're going to see how that correlates back to race. And this is what we found, which was quite astounding to us. Even though these were public records where, you know, you should be able to take these records and be able to tell us something very straightforwardly about this person because it's out there. Um, for nearly 50% of Hispanic people, the data broker said, we've got no idea. We don't know who this person is. Um, and you can see as that contrasts with white people, it's like a big distinction, right, in terms of how well the data brokers do. Now you'll notice that it's worse, worse for Asian and Hispanic people. And we have some sort of suggestive things in the data, which are so suggestive they can't actually be in the public pa paper, but this is a keynote, so I can just tell you about my theories, which is that in the end, we think it's got something to do with the commonality of last names. In that it just so happens that as a group, Hispanic people often share last names, 
And similarly, there are certain Asian groups, you know, say people from Korea or the Philippines, where there's a lot of commonality of last name. And our best guess is the moment that you have people with the same last name is the moment that the algorithm's sort of giving up and just saying we don't know, right? And not really even trying to do any match. And so we think this is a really important result. Uh, you'll also notice that um, though accuracy is sort of reasonably similar across different racial groups, it's particularly bad for black people. Um, it's sort of, if you look at the baseline, it's sort of 20% worse. Um, and we feel that is also something to really take from this exercise. All right. I'll just pause in case, because I actually showed you some data and results. I'll just pause in case there are any questions. While we're at the pause, I realize I neglected to do something. Um, because there are some law people in attendance that are getting continuing legal education requirements, I'm supposed to give two words, one at the beginning and the end. This is the beginning one, even though it's not the beginning. It is summary. All right? Sorry, that's not a question. Well, isn't it lucky I stopped, though? But that's great. Well, I think everyone's probably looking at the clock and yeah. saying, oh my gosh, well, let's, let's, let's make sure she finishes in time. We've got a long day in front of us. So um, what I'll say is that, you know, why should we care about this? Um, and I'll tell you this, that generally, if I present this work to a lot of legal scholars, they're almost jubilant at the end. And the reason, uh, or policymakers, or Europeans, um, the reason they are jubilant is because they're like, this is the best result we've ever had. Uh, you're telling us that data brokers, which are almost certainly evil, are more likely to have bad data lack of data about poor people. You know, for them, that's, you know, that, as they say, sort of European policy slash legal, there's sort of almost jubilation, because like, for, you know, if, if you sort of assume that profiling is evil, then uh, for once, like, evil's not being wrought upon uh, poor people. But, you know, this is why I worry. You know, yes, you know, again, if you hate the idea of advertising, you may think, okay, this is great if poor people um, I'll receive less relevant ads, that's brilliant. But on the other hand, remember, these data brokers that I'm looking at, they are data brokers which are often being used not just for making advertising allocation decisions, but also really quite consequential decisions such as background checks, employment verification. These are the data brokers that if you rent an apartment, the landlord will try and run a background check on you. And so yes, of course, my insights are just coming from the fact I'm a marketing professor and I've got access to this sort of world. But you know, I don't have any reason to think if it's the same firm um, that's, you know, that most of these are attached to big credit agencies, these data brokers, that there should be any reason why some of these results won't hold in things which, where we might actually have, you know, substantial economic consequences of there not being a record, right? And maybe the Ford experiment is, you know, let's imagine that I'm renting out an apartment and I can't run a background check with people. You know, I don't have to be one of you wonderful theorists, right, to say there's got to be some kind of inference or signal coming from that. Okay, so, you know, this is sort of my summary of the stuff which I'm passionate about, which is just pointing out that data is often but, smart. But, but, but hold on, so what's your story for the market failure that doesn't encourage a data broker to improve accuracy? Well, let's think about it. I could tell you market failure in advertising, and then we can think how it might generalize out to something like a background check, right? Um, so it's got to be sim simply, you know, maybe it's more simply put as this. You know, to be able to verify the quality of information, you have to have a source of ground truth, right? But the problem is, if you're an advertiser, is that ultimately, um, there's so many things that could go wrong with advertising. You could have the wrong creative, you could have the wrong targeting strategy, it could just be the wrong timing, all of these things, things could go wrong. And so given that all of these things go wrong, it's very hard to, as a result, you're very unlikely to work out that what's going on what's going wrong is actually the data that you're using to fuel all those decisions. Now, again, and so that means because we can't really verify the fact that this what is performing poorly, 
it's going to be, we might have a market failure. Now, another source of market failure is more what I call sort of more just typical principal agent, which is that Nico, who's wonderful, has gone and presented all this stuff at advertising conferences. You know the kind of conference, you don't can't imagine, but the every big black screens, music goes up when you come up, you know, you pace around the room in your black turtle, that, that kind of thing. And he goes to these conferences and he presents the work, and then everyone ignores him. There's literally been a book written about people ignoring Nico. And I'm not <laughs> sure whether <laughs> Tim Wang wrote a book, I think, about like basically people ignoring Nico. And I don't know how it's gonna work for his tenure case, right? That like, people write a book about you, but it's about people ignoring you. <laughs> anyway, so um No uh, they're bad publicity. No bad publicity, <laughs> right? <laughs> But you know, in some sense, right, you know, if you think about it, uh, advertising, again, we've got lots of agency problems, right? That, you know, we've got advertising agencies on behalf of clients. Does anyone want to really admit they've been wasting hundreds of millions of dollars on this data for the past decade, right? Um, now, you know, then if we think, well, do we think those kind of principal agent, lack of verifiability concerns might apply elsewhere in the economy? Um, you know, I only have sort of more anecdotal information, but you know, again, imagine, imagine you're a car leasing company, and this is an example I recently came across, and you don't, you're using these background checks to work out whether or not someone should get your lease, you're targeting sort of low income people. In the end, what forces are in place there to help you ascertain whether or not this is accurate? Right, the information you're using to make these, these decisions. So I think, again, it's that lack of feedback loop or lack of ground truth, which allows us to verify whether or not the prediction was right if we're buying this data. But, but your work suggested a relatively, at, at least in one setting, a relatively simple test, which is you take data that you know about and, 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 you, and you ask them to make the prediction, right? And, and you could imagine running an RFQ where you say, Unless you're at least seventy percent on this data, don't bother submitting a bid. Oh, I should. So no, I agree. But let me also tell you a story, yeah. which is that this table may look remarkably simple. It's what I always call my billion-dollar table. And why is that? Basically, we had a secret co-author who I've never met, never talked to, um, who was the head of the largest Australian advertising agency at the time. We only got access to his data because he threatened to pause a billion dollars worth of spending unless they allowed us to actually get in the middle of the ad tech stack and measure this. So you have to have... Friends in high places. Friends in high places. <laughs> and again, like if you think about a lot, maybe another way of saying it is if you think about a lot of the entities which are using, say, you know, whether you're an advertiser, whether there may be agency problems or whether or not you're you know, say a small landlord or the kind of firm that's running employment checks, again, right, you don't necessarily have the power of Tim Whitfield to sort of go into the system and make these comparisons. All right. Um, you know what? I just noticed the time, and I also know as a conference, oh, no, as a conference organizer, I know how important the first break is. So I think what I'm going to do is I will leave you with these thoughts which is my sort of provocative conclusion as we go to the break, are as follows. I spent most of my career thinking about digital privacy, but you know my most recent research has made me worry a lot about coverage and the idea of data deserts. And perhaps for low-income people, maybe that kind of exclusion is a bigger concern and one which we should also be thinking about whenever we talk about the privacy debate. And so in other words, you know, are we really putting the white weightings, I guess, when we're thinking about the privacy debate and privacy regulation, in that it definitely seems to be something which we might expect to have uh, slightly regressive consequences, given what I've seen. Um, uh, my other sort of provocative conclusion is like, what do you do about this? And I think this was your question, right? You know, and you, you actually gave, basically gave this slide, which is, look, we just don't really have enough auditing and algorithms, I would argue, in our, you know, we don't have enough, we, you know, people talk about algorithmic transparency and auditing, 
But a lot of what I am pointing out here is not really going to help us because, as you say, you have to have that source of ground truth to work out how the predictions are different. You know, so instead, you know, maybe, again, if I was a proper keynote and was really wearing a black turtle net, I'd be able to sell this better. But really what I'm trying to say is, you know, that food deserts, right, are something we all know about and care about, but maybe we should also in the digital economy be thinking too about data deserts. So with that, I think it's definitely time for our break. What do you think? We have a break, but other, before we do, I can't resist but ask one more opportunity if anyone has any questions for Catherine before we stop. Yeah, I will have a, a quick question. Okay. Uh, I was interested in knowing what you think uh, about uh, the possibility that we create an, an algorithm that is truly unbiased. Because, uh, uh, you know, when we speak about algorithmic bias and we look at data, uh, I think, yeah, data is something that is infinitive. So I feel, uh, is it possible to create an algorithm okay. that is? So, I mean, I don't know if anyone else has been observing what's happening with our computer science brethren on this topic. In that, basically, what I would say, this is my sort of very terrible summary of that literature. So, what was released was we had the Compass data set, and I'm sure you all have heard about it. It's the data set where there was an algorithmic tool used to make predictions about bail hearings, right, whether or not someone should get bail. And you run the regression, and then you find out, you know, that the algorithm seems to be suggesting that more black people don't get um, bail, and that's like a portion. And so that was the concern. And then, you know, so the papers initially were written about that. And then I would say for the last five years, the computer science literature has been rediscovering the concept of statistical discrimination. And so, you know, if you're in, I don't know if, I don't even know if they t teach, this is Econ PhDs, anyway, I'm obviously getting old. But certainly, if you remember, like this, so this 1970s movement where people were actually trying to grapple with statistical discrimination and what it means, um, you know, out of Chicago. And I would say that if you think about the computer science literature since then, they've been like, this is really hard and we don't have an easy solution. So I think that's where the literature is. And I don't think anyone's ever really been able to have a good answer for statistical discrimination. Um, and certainly I haven't seen it yet in the literature. Last question. Yes. Uh, how much of this effect is driven merely by the fact <laughs> that data brokers have more of a financial incentive to get it right with rich people because that's where the money is? versus the data isn't available for them to get into their systems. Okay, so this is heartbreaking, Gus. <laughs> In my very many investigations, you know, I sort of ran, um, you know, I ran a, you know, the regression, which, because that's mainly what you think as an economist, right? Um, and so I ran a regression, you know, on how much you can earn from that group versus how accurate it was. And you know what, there was absolutely nothing. And I discovered it was my, it was me just not understanding the industry. Basically, there's no differential, this is a commodity. Uh, predictions about age, gender, location. They're just priced like a commodity. And there's no real variation on rich people versus not. And so therefore we're not picking that up. That's just why I wasn't picking and with that, please join me in thanking Catherine for a wonderful keynote. And I can say that she met the bar previously set of giving an exceptional keynote to end to open our conference this time. Mm -hmm. I am honor bound to say two things. The, uh, the second key uh, word for the continuing legal education is kite. And we shall reconvene at 11.30 for the paper by Alex Mola. See you then. Uh, the first CLE word for this session is keynote. Take it away, Rakesh. Uh, pleased to have Alex Smolin visiting us from the Toulouse School of Economics. Its the platform is yours. Uh, 
Thank you, Rakesh. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you very much for the center for supporting this work. It's been a great help. And in this work, we are exploring uh, eco algorithmic consumption, design, prices, and data. And this is a joint work with Shota Ikihashi, who is at Queen's University. So let me start with a bit of bigger picture, uh, kind of economic context for this kind of work. Uh, as you all know, the advances in information technology, which allow ever more decisions to be driven by algorithms. And you can think about robo-advisors, price trackers, search engines, and chatbots that are proliferating, and most recently exemplified by ChatGPT, which are impacting more and more the society. One consequence of this uh, informational uh, technological evolution uh, is that decisions become more informed, responsive, flexible, and automated. And you can think that this will lead to the fact that some sort of new kind of society economy will be emerging, and it will lead to a redistribution of power. And there are a lot of concerns about how, how, wh where are we heading with that. So with this broad context in mind, uh, there has been recently a, a lot of economic work on uh, algorithmic pricing, where in some sense, uh, there, there were economists who were exploring the fact how algorithmic decision making can empower sellers, for example, allow for collusion by algorithmic pricing. What we would like to do in this work is to study perhaps underrepresented part uh, of the bargaining uh, process is the, uh, are the consumers. So what we'd like to do is to understand can algorithmic decisions empower consumers? And if so, how it can be done and to what extent? Uh, once we lay down this framework, we can think about also how does algorithmic consumption impact welfare, allocation, pricing, etc. And then we will also study the impact of data interventions. We will understand how does data availability can affect uh, market outcomes and welfare redistribution. So this is kind of broad kind of questions we would like to address with our uh, framework. And this is an economics talk. Uh, this will be uh, a BIMA presentation, but I hope I will deliver some economic insights that will hold more generally uh, for various audiences. Okay, so let me be a bit more specific what exactly we do. Because we want to understand how algorithmic decisions can empower consumers, we will study a very classic setting in which the traditionally the power on the side of the seller. So we'll study the classic monopoly setting, where there is one seller, one buyer and one product for trade. And this, as a standard in this kind of questions, the buyer value and the seller costs are uncertain, so we do not know whether it's sufficient uh, to make a trade or not, example. But there is an algorithm that can direct the buyer to a product based on its value and the price. And this is what we would like to understand in some sense how use of this algorithm can empower the consumers. And important in this framework is that algorithm design will affect the seller's pricing strategy and will affect the product allocation. Right? Because it will basically, the different algorithms will correspond to different demands uh, faced by the seller. And what we would like to study in this framework is first what algorithm maximizes the buyer's payoff? It will be interesting in the buyer optimal algorithm. And what is special about this algorithm? Second, what happens to wealth and prices when the algorithm becomes more precise? For example, because it gets more abundant data about the consumer or about the product. What happens to equilibrium outcomes? And finally, what happens when it is the seller obtains more data, for example, about consumer for the purposes of price discrimination. This is a very important topic uh, in general, uh, and we would like to understand how algorithmic consumption affects uh, uh, the uh, conclusions of this. And this is the, our main results and implications, which uh, in some sense will be quite striking, striking and giving in some sense fresh, fresh perspective on these questions. First. We fully characterize the optimal algorithm, and we highlight that the buyer optimal algorithm should make intentional errors in order to influence the seller's pricing. That is, making errors meaning sometimes 
not recommending the product even though value of estimated value is above the price and sometimes recommending the product even though estimated value is below the price so even though in some sense these are exposed errors it turns out that these are the errors that should be made in order to uh, in some sense exert downward pressure on the seller's price and this is what will ultimately benefit the consumers one implication in some sense that holds broadly from this result is that the buyer actually benefits from not having access to value information himself or herself because if the buyer knew perfectly value then the buyer would would not be able to make this kind of errors you know if you know the value if you know the price you will be always tempted to buy the product if your value is above the price and not buying if the value is below the price whereas this is something not optimal so in some sense the buyer would not like to know the information himself or herself but the buyer would be willing to delegate this information to some third party some some imaginary algorithm designer who would be then designing algorithm and and making these trade recommendations on behalf of the buyer in some sense. So the second set of results belongs to the uh, analysis what happens if the algorithm becomes more accurate maybe because it got access to more data or maybe because there was improvement in some algorithm architecture not surprisingly because the job of the algorithm is to maximize buyer payoff the buyer's expected payoff will increase however and perhaps more surprisingly this increase in uh, buyer's payoff will be associated with the increase in prices posted in the economy. And this will happen intuitively because more precise algorithm allow, is able to identify high value consumers. And efficiency considerations require to actually trade for these high value customers, even with high cost sellers. But to do that, you should be able to sustain high prices in equilibrium. And once you do that, all sellers are tempted to post higher prices. So this kind of exerts down upward pressure on prices, which sometimes, and we will illustrate in the examples, can lead to the fact that all sellers in the economy all of a sudden start charging higher prices, but consumers are also better off, quite counterintuitively. And, and in some sense, one takeaway from that, that in the presence of algorithmic consumption, higher prices do not necessarily imply a loss of consumer surplus. And the third uh, uh, the result that we have is what happens when the seller obtains data and engages in uh, third degree price discrimination. So you can think of it as different market segmentations of consumers charging different prices for consumers in different segments. And what we show is that in that case, if the buyer is guarded by uh, algorithmic con uh, consumption, then the buyer's expected payoff undergoes was in, in statistics is called mean preserving contraction what what does it mean that the on average the buyer's expected payoff remains the same so in fact the consumer surplus doesn't change the consumers on average are not hurt by uh, price discrimination however because the price nevertheless will be more correlated with value the the the, uh, the variation of payoffs in population will become uh, less uh, prevalent. So in some sense, the, the population will be more equalized in terms of surplus distribution. So somehow, somewhat surprisingly, price discrimination will not harm consumer surplus on average, but it will redistribute welfare across buyer values. And this is something that you would not get from in the absence of algorithmic consumption, right? Usually, you know, if you provide value uh, information to the seller, the seller will just extract full surplus. But this will not happen if the consumers are uh, guarded by algorithms. Okay, so this is kind of the broad uh, the uh, results and implications. So unless there are questions, we let's go into the model to see exactly what, what, what I'm talking about. Okay, so let's go into the model, and the model is very standard. Um, the core of the model is very standard uh, monopoly setting, right? There is a monopoly seller of a product and the buyer. The buyer's value is uncertain. It's denoted by V. 
and it uh, belongs to the interval between the lower bar and the upper bar, right? Here. And it's distributed according to some distribution g. The seller's cost is also uncertain, belongs to the interval between zero and one, and distributed according to the distribution f. And for simplicity, the, our leading example will be uh, when uh, both costs and values are uniformly distributed between zero and one. This is very standard. Uh, example to keep in mind. If trade happens at price P, the payoff pay of the buyer will be V minus P or the seller P minus C. This is all standard. Trade doesn't happen, we have zero payoffs. So far, it's all very standard. What is not standard and what we introduced with our work is this algorithm. So the, that will be making recommendations for the consumer. So we will assume that the buyer initially knows neither x value no existence of the product. However, there is an algorithm that can recommend the product to this buyer based on the value, and we can think that uh, that algorithm has access to data and is able to estimate perfectly this value uh, for the consumer, for the buyer, and on the price. Because you could naturally think that in applications, whether the product is recommended to you should also depend on the price. And mathematically, this algorithm, therefore, can be simply characterized by a function, R, R for recommendation function, that maps the value and the price into a probability of recommendation. It's just this object. And note that by making this abstraction, so just thinking about mathematical functions, we abstract away from software implementation details, which are, of course, very important in practice. But Ultimately, in some sense, what will matter in the model is this probability of recommendation uh, for different value, for different price, what is the probability that you receive recommendation. It doesn't, in some sense, matter at the end of the day whether this probability comes from some machine learning uh, estimation, whether it's hard-coded uh, or in which language, uh, uh, which programming language this algorithm is written. Right, so, in some sense, from the economics perspective, the, this is this uh, object which was matters. And what is the timing in this model? If you have a fixed algorithm, the timing is as follows. First, the value and costs are realized. The seller absorbs the costs. The seller knows the cost of the production, but not the value, and decides which price to post. Then, algorithm recommends a product with promise probability uh, uh, R uh, as a function of the value and the price. If recommended, the buyer observes price and makes a decision whether to buy or not. So there is buyer is always still in the loop. This is the buyer who makes a final decision whether to purchase or not. The algorithm simply recommends product and provides information in some sense by the fact that it's recommended. If the product is not recommended, the trade doesn't occur. Just the buyer is not aware of the product and doesn't purchase. The solution concept is a perfect Bayesian equilibrium. What it basically means that is that the buyer, whenever observing recommendation, will be making rational Bayesian updating about the value, will be forming expectation about the per value for the purchase, and purchasing, uh, purchasing the expected values about the price and not purchasing otherwise. More importantly, what it means for the seller. Because imagine that you are the seller, you know your costs, and you are aware that there's this algorithm that operates. Basically, you can predict for every single posted price what will be a probability of a trade. So you can basically estimate this algorithmic demand curve. And sellers of different costs will be charging different prices uh, given this algorithmic demand curve. This happens for a given algorithm. Whereas what we'd like to understand is what is a buyer optimal algorithm? Which algorithm maximizes the buyer expected payoff? If you understand that once algorithm is fixed, the game will be unrolling like that. So this is basic question, um, and we'll give you the answer. Any question about the timing, the model? No? So you haven't yet said anything about what the benchmark is in the absence of 
of such an algorithm? Yes, so, so it's, a, it's a great question. So, because there could be several benchmarks in the absence of algorithm. I guess one benchmark you can think of is that, you know, if there is no algorithm, then the trade just doesn't happen. There is zero. The, the buyer can never discover. So this is a boring benchmark, uh, and clearly we will improve upon that. A more interesting benchmark, I think, that to, to think of is that what if buyer is aware of the product and uh, actually no, can estimate the valuation perfectly, so may, making these exposed optimal decisions. Uh, and in that benchmark, this would be basically the standard monopoly setting that we all uh, teach to our students. And what we will show that our algorithm will outperform that setting. Be why? Because in that setting, the buyer will be making this exposed optimal decision. In some sense, buyer will not be having any, um, uh, will not be able to resist to purchase if the value is above the price and not purchase the values below the price. Therefore, the buyer will not be able to make strategic influence on the pricing of the seller. And this is where we think the algorithm actually is very important, the, the use of some sort of recommendation automated algorithms, because they can shift, the, so kind of give some sort, sort of commitment power to the buyer and shift this bargaining power towards the consumer. And we will clearly outperform on that. And, and of course, the interesting part will be uh, how we, in which way this algorithm should be designed to, uh, to, to empower the, the buyers, which kind of mistakes you should be doing. Yes, yes. A, a clarification question. So uh, suppose the algorithm recommends the product and the, you, the buyer does not like it? Yes. Is it possible that they do a recommendation again, or that's the end of the game? That's the end of the game. I see. That's the end of the game. But uh, I think uh, in some sense, here the, the, the buyer has no private information. The algorithm knows, can perfectly predict, predict that if you will be making this recommendation, the buyer will be accepting or not. So in some sense, there is, uh, it's without loss of generality that you cannot make additional. Thank you. Yeah. Great. OK, so with this in mind, let's think, uh, give some, some examples of algorithms. Because I think it's, in some sense, uh, a new object that we introduced a little bit in the study. Uh, I mean, it's studied in many other works, but in this setting, I think, as, as this recommendation function, I think it's relatively new. And it can be illustrated very nicely uh, by this uh, plot. Right, so this is a two-dimensional plot. There's prices on x-axis and the values on the y-axis. And algorithm basically it will be deciding for which value points you will be re recommending the product, for which points, and for which you will not be recommending the product. And, oops. And there are many algorithms you can imagine, but let's go for several examples. First one is, in some sense, price-based algorithm. This is one you could always imagine, uh, where the recommendation depends only on the product's price. You can think of it as a sort of a price tracker. You, you say, check, check the prices of the product and recommend the, the product if the uh, price is below 0.5, for example. This algorithm will be represented by this function, where the, in this region, of this combination of values and prices, the product will be recommended. In this region, the product will not be recommended. It's, it's an algorithm, but it's not necessarily a very clever algorithm, because it completely ignores the value. So there will be losses from the value mismatch. Right. Another algorithm is the algorithm that depends only on the product's value. You can say it's a sort of value tracker. You tell, recommend me the product uh, if my value for the product is above 0.5. Uh, and this would be corresponding for this. You, you, you're recommending uh, in this region probability 1, you're recommending in this region probability 0. Here, of course, again, there are possibly losses from the price mismatch, right? because you, your recommendation doesn't account for the price. I guess you can think, well, there is an easy fix, the algorithm that combines the best of these two worlds. Why don't we have this exposed optimal algorithm? 
that recommends whenever the trade benefits the buyer, whenever value is greater or equal than the price. And that algorithm can be represented basically by this uh, picture when you recommend everywhere above the diagonal line uh, and do not recommend everywhere, uh, everywhere else. And this is also the sort of decisions that the buyer with no commitment power or full information would be making. Second. But of course, clearly, we will show that this algorithm also will be not, will be not optimal because it will be ignoring the strategic impact on prices that you can uh, induce. Yes, Ken. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things I find about with this setup is um, um, when you don't recommend a product, there is no possibility of trade. So it's even if I would compute my expected value condition on not being recommended, uh, it could well be that I would maybe like the product, but I'm not able to buy by the very version. Yes. Product. Like in the optimal uh, mechanism, would would it have the property that when not recommended, I would not want to buy anyway, or am I shutting off some people who yes. would have otherwise wanted to buy? Yes. Okay. Excellent question. So basically, uh, if you're not recommended, why uh, uh, does it matter that you cannot buy? So we make this assumption for simplicity, and because often we think about. Uh, you know, for consumers, it's hard to keep track of all possible products. So basically, you may literally may not be aware of some products unless they're recommended. So I think it's quite realistic. But you're right that, in fact, in some cases, this assumption is restrictive. In others, it will not. That sometimes, if the, the consumer is not able to assess information, uh, the product himself, then the fact that the product is not recommended will su give sufficiently bad news to the buyer that the buyer will not be purchasing the product anyways. So, for example, in the leading example of uniform costs and values, the, this, uh, this, will not, this assumption will not be binding. So even if the buyer could purchase a product, uh, the, the same uh, uh, algorithm remains optimal. You, but you're saying for some other distributions, it may well be... Yes, sometimes it might bank. be binding. Sometimes it might be binding, but it's relatively easy to recuperate analysis. It's just one constraint that you add, and uh, I think there will be possibly distortions, uh, uh, but yes, sometimes it might be fine. But it's very easy to incorporate in some sense in the framework. We do it for simplicity, for, for cleanness of the analysis. Yes? Okay, great. So now, then let's think a little bit about economics of, of this algorithm design, if you want to uh, maximize the, the, the buyers, uh, buyer power. The first concern that you care about is efficiency, right? As so always in economics. So you, in, in efficiency boils down to the fact that you don't want, in equilibrium, you don't want to miss valuable trades. That is, whenever the value is above the cost, in principle, you would like to trade because this is where the surplus is generated, right? At the same time, there is this influence component, uh, which I alluded to, that you also want to exert this downward pressure on prices. Right? Uh, so in some sense, you may want to punish the too high of the prices and you reward the, the low prices. And the, all these things are complicated by, by the uncertainty that the algorithm designer doesn't know the seller's costs. This is a seller's private information. And because of that, how the seller will be responding to different algorithms is unknown. So this is something you should be taking into account. And the final uh, point is this persuasion component. Because the buyer is still in the loop, the buyer should, should still be willing to purchase the product whenever recommended. And sometimes it, will be, uh, it may be binding. It will be less binding in our framework because we, uh, we design algorithm to maximize the buyer's payoff. So this, this will not be very uh, binding uh, uh, constraint. But in principle, it's something that should be taken into account. Okay, so with these general trade-offs, let's see how we actually solve for the algorithm. Uh, and this turns out to be doable in several steps. So the first step is a standard uh, uh, in mechanism design uh, literature. Is without also generality, we can focus on incentive compatible recommendations. Exactly, because if the pro buyer doesn't purchase whenever recommended, you can just uh, drop those recommendations from the algorithm, nothing will change. More uh, uh, substantially is that this observation 
that for each price, the algorithm should prioritize high value trades. And the, the intuition is as follows. The seller is concerned only with trade volume, right? In some sense, the seller in this framework doesn't care about uh, trade values. However, the buyer is better off when the trade occurs at the higher value because the, the, buyer, the buyer derives the value from the trade. That means that for whenever for, for some price you want to deliver a certain trade volume to the seller, you want to start doing it starting from the high value uh, high values because in this way uh, in some sense it's a backpacking problem uh, you want to uh, you, if if they all take the same volume you should be uh, starting with the best uh, trades possible and this observation leads to the following class of algorithms which turns out to be important uh, there's a threshold algorithm which is characterized by a threshold function the hat which basically recommends the product if and only if value is greater than some price dependent threshold right so so this is uh, this is a class of algorithms which will be prioritizing high value trades whenever trade happens and they are important because of this lemma so for any algorithm and any equilibrium in it there exists a threshold algorithm in which the buyer will be following a recommendation and that another algorithm will yield a greater buyer's expected payoff and the same seller's expected payoff, Z under R. In some sense, if you start with arbitrary algorithm, you can tweak it a little bit, turn it into a threshold uh, algorithm and increase the buyer surplus and leave the seller profits the same. In economic terms, threshold algorithms cover parity efficient algorithms. So if you and, and this is, in some sense, one could think, uh, one should think about. Uh, and obviously, Pareto efficient algorithms include buyer optimal. So, in what what follows, without loss of generality, we can focus on fresh code algorithms. And algorithm design reduces to the design of this threshold function when you want to recommend the product at different prices. Well, it's already it's already a big improvement because it's much easier to maximize over a class of functions than uh, of one-dimensional function than two-dimensional. Uh, but still, it's some work to be done. So let's think then how to design this threshold, uh, recommendation threshold function. What, what happens when you start tweaking these recommendation thresholds? If you fix a price, think what when you what you recommend uh, at a given price a threshold a fixed price trades off trade volume right the lower the threshold the higher the more the trade volume will be going on it trades off trade surplus which is integration of these values over this volume it and also trades off revenue which is price multiplied by the trade volume uh, at that price so this is what happens at one price now the the threshold function then effectively offers a menu of options to the seller because a function will pin down, uh, will give the seller the options to post different possible prices and different possible prices will lead to different trade volumes and different revenues and this is what the seller cares about. Right? And as you see that this menu design then it's naturally then can be analyzed as a screening problem because you do not know the seller's cost and you want to screen this information and this can actually be uh, approached with fairly standard uh, tools uh, from the regulatory analysis okay and since we have three screening problem not surprisingly what will matter is the virtual cost right is the is the real cost adjusted by the informational component by the hazard rate and, and a standard assumed that this virtual costs are strictly increasing in C simplicity and then we have the characterization so characterization has two parts first is what algorithm actually looks like an algorithm has a threshold function this re relatively complicated expression where the price this price is defined here but you can ignore it for now what matters is that actually it's strictly and continuously increasing on some range of prices 
So it's not something very trivial like step function. So it's something actually rich, even with this simple setting with single product uh, uh, monopoly, we, we get a uh, rich optimal behavior. Uh, at the at some, this lower equilibrium price, you will be recommending the product with probability one. That is the threshold is at the lowest value, uh, and at the highest equilibrium price, you will be the threshold will be above the price. So that would correspond to this under recommendation at the highest price. And what is more interesting, even perhaps, that what happens in equilibrium? Then equilibrium, the type C will be posting this price which we can calculate in the closed form as that. This is an uh, expectation of uh, this inverse of the virtual cost function with respect to values, uh, conditional on uh, the event that value is greater than the virtual cost. And even more importantly, what will happen that in equilibrium, the type C seller will be trading if and only if the value is above the virtual cost. So ultimately, what behavior will be induced by the algorithm is that uh, that that will be defined by this uh, allocation. And this is notable because it means that this equilibrium allocation, look, the virtual costs depend only on the distribution of costs, and this is just value. Equilibrium allocation doesn't depend on value distribution at all. It depends only on cost distribution, but not on the value distribution. Uh, so, however, the optimal algorithm and the pr optimal prices that will be posted does depend on both value and cost distribution. Therefore, uh, when, once the distribution of values will be changing, even though the equilibrium allocation will not be changing, the, the optimal algorithm and prices will be changing. And something that I alluded to before, uh, that exante optimal algorithm makes ex post errors. So it will always be doing under-recommending at the highest price, but sometimes it will also be doing over-recommending. The second, and equilibrium will sustain the range of prices. The higher prices will lead to lower trade values. Yes, Ken? I'm just trying to understand, like, um, um, like a, so in, in a simpler, simpler version of the model where, let's say, the cost is constant, I know the cost. I yes. guess you could do something like, I will only ever recommend your product if you price at marginal cost. Otherwise, I never exactly. recommend it. And then I, I recommend it in an efficient way. But here, the distortion is basically you're trying to screen the C types, the cost types, right? Exactly. That, that, that's what the exactly. Is. So in some sense, this is in some sense even the simplest benchmark to keep in mind. If the costs were known, or like distribution of costs is concentrated uh, or on some mass point, then what this algorithm consume. Uh, consumer can do is to demand basically the, demand the, the given price you say that your price should be equal to your cost uh, and then otherwise I will not trade with you and then it will generate efficient trade however if the cost is not known this creates all sort of problems because you do not know which price to demand and this is exactly why we need this analysis yes but this is helpful and and we have uh, I probably will not go over this remark but we had this discussion in the paper because it gives substantial power to the uh, consumers. Okay, but let me illustrate, because it's all a little bit abstract. Let's go over one simple example with this uniform cost. It's very standard, uh, and I think it it's actually turns out to be very easy to solve in cost form. So let the value and the cost be uniformly distributed on the U0 and 1. The virtual cost in this case are well known to be 2C, or you can just calculate it. The inverse of the virtual cost will be then V over half. And the optimal pricing can be calculated by the formulas that we uh, that, that presented in the proposition as being this. So types below one half will be trading at a progressively high, the progressively more higher cost sellers will be trading at progressively higher prices, and types above one half never trade. So you can think that there is algorithmic exclusion of those types. Uh, and uh, um, the, the threshold, the optimal algorithm threshold, can be also calculated from these things. But one picture is worth thousands of words. So this is a picture. So this is how the optimal uh, the <coughs> algorithm will look like. Right? Again, we operate in our familiar space, uh, prices, uh, values. The exposed optimal algorithm would be 
uh, corresponding to this diagonal line, right? And this is the exanto optimum. So you can see that it always recommends a trade if price is below one quarter. And then the higher the price, it recommends to progressively fewer uh, uh, on top of other regulatory tools. And this is, seems to be relatively new. At least I never, I didn't see people talking about that possibility, but I think this is something that helped. Yes, so, there was still one. <laughs> It was really terminating, but I should really... Oh, sorry, slides back up. Uh, slides, yeah. yes, they're up. Oh. oh, they're not they here they anymore. Didn't have, they didn't have the age. Yes. Okay, so we can... <laughs> well, it's very dangerous to have that button <laughs> right in the middle of the clicker. <laughs> and yeah, we can continue that scan. We trust you? Yes. Well, <laughs> I mean... I use this USB card everywhere, so... Where's uh, it Yeah, maybe we need to click. Try. Yes, we can. Well, we can. Yeah, that's better. Oh. So, yeah. Always a better finish. idea. Excellent. Thank you. So, okay. Yes, okay. Okay. Great. So this is where we stopped and we're useful discussion about motivating the, the whole exercise. So so but this is the algorithm that it is optimal in this example. And let me highlight that this algorithm does a couple of two mistakes. Um, uh, yes, yes, I need to click on it, I remember, yes. Yes, now it works. So it says two sets of mistakes. In this region, it, over uh, it under recommends a product for higher prices. Whenever price is above one third, you can see, even though the value is above the price, the algorithm doesn't recommend. Whereas in this region, the opposite, it over recommends the product. Whenever the price is below one third, it recommends the product even though the value is below the price. So it makes both kind of uh, exposed mistakes, but on average, making these mistakes actually is helpful because it forces the seller to uh, lower the price. Okay, so faced with this uh, algorithm, what the seller would do, right? The seller in some sense doesn't actually, doesn't, don't, don't need to care about uh, these details of the algorithm and details of value distribution. What the seller cares about is the demand curve, right? What is the, the probability of a trade for different prices? And this is what would, would be this algorithmic demand curve. And, uh, and you can see that uh, yes, it, it, it garages relatively to the dashed line is this exposed optimal demand curve, and this is ex ante optimal demand curve. This demand curve encourages low prices relatively to, to higher prices. And of course, faced with this demand curve, different seller types will be posted to different prices. And in particular, this will be the, the optimal pricing strategy in equilibrium. What will happen is that the, the, yes, this, the type C. The type C below 0.5, the, the, the zero cost uh, type will be uh, um, setting the price equal to a quarter. So it will be the lowest equilibrium price. Right? Then the higher the cost you have, the more progressively uh, higher price you will be posting, unless your cost reaches one half, at which point you will not be any more fine profitable to be participating in the market. We assume you just post the highest price, but in this case, the algorithm will not be already recommending uh, any, any consumers to you. Uh, and, and importantly, the resulting equilibrium allocation that is, uh, depends on both optimal seller pricing and the, uh, the algorithm behavior will be that the values will be traded whenever the values will be above the virtual cost. And this is very simple, uh, in some sense, allocation structures that, that have. You know, virtual cost equal to C, and 
values above it will be the, the values will be traded relative to efficient allocation uh, value above the cost. Okay, uh, so this is the optimal recommender system. Uh, so optimal recommendation algorithm. Let me skip these two remarks uh, for the sake of time and let's uh, equipped with this optimal characterization, uh, we can uh, study two data intervention. First, providing data to the algorithm. Second, providing data to the seller. Uh, actually, hold, hold on, Alex. I, I yes? want to ask um, the data algorithm that's making recommendations to me seems observationally indistinguishable from an algorithm that's going to disguise me. In which sense discuss so, you? So, so, uh, okay, so I'm a sedentary male, well-to-do. <laughs> I'm going to use an algorithm that will that will search and behave on the internet, um, and so that it will fool a broker into thinking that I'm in fact young, female, and not well-to-do. <laughs> right. So um, observationally, I, it's not clear to me. I, I don't see. Because at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're changing the demand curve that the seller thinks yes. they're facing, right? If, right. A, if a seller's model of demand is, is, it's a function of your characteristics, tells me the demand curve, then I could imagine a world where I want an algorithm that will convince the seller that I have different characteristics so that they think I have a different demand curve. It yes. would have the same effect it's qualitatively an as what you're suggesting. But yes. it would not run into the problem that one had talked about, which is, uh, oh, I guess it could, right? Because it could be that in order to be credible about my characteristics, I will have to refuse some trades. Yeah, I mean, I think yes. if the algorithm sort of fought with your identity, it would still have to induce noise in that identity. For yes, it would have to induce identity. To be... and, and importantly, I think, I mean, I need to think more whether there's exact mapping. But importantly, right here, the power comes from the fact that you can condition information on the price. So in your scenario, it would also should be the, better be the case that your disguise will be driven depending on the price that the seller uh, posts. Posts, right. Yes. Which, uh, right. Yeah. And this is an important component, exactly. Now, you, in answer to one's question, you went straight to, for this to work for consumers, We'd have to we'd have to allow only a monopoly <laughs> algorithm. Um, the other interpretation is anyone advocating an algorithmic solution to increase consumer surplus is dead in the water. <laughs> yeah, yes, I mean it's, it's, it highlights that you know it, 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 there's some possibility for regulation. I mean, we can use it from this side because one thing you know you can actually regulate how algorithm, what algorithm does. Right? You can want to say that you actually don't want to have perfect algorithms and you want to uh, require certain errors. And you can, you know, you can uh, frame it very differently. You can say that algorithm is not allowed to condition certain characteristics. Then it will not be perfect. And by doing it in certain ways, you can perhaps approximate the buyer optimal algorithm. But this is kind of its answer to follow-up questions you can ask. If we, if we go down that road, um, this hypothetical algorithm provider, where do they get the data that allows them to estimate my preferences? Yes, uh, maybe from those brokers. Uh, but yes, he, we, we are abstract away. They get data from somewhere, maybe from consumers, maybe from sellers. Uh, but you, they need, you need data. And this is, okay, I think this is excellent uh, segue into the next uh, thing. Let's get data to the algorithm, more or less. Because algorithms are fueled by data, and the data is becoming increasingly abundant. So I guess it can come from different sources. Uh, but what we would like to understand, what impact greater availability of data or smaller availability of data will, might have on algorithmic outcomes. And our framework can tractably address this question, because it, in some sense, in our framework, what basically more data will do it will correspond to some better estimate of devaluation, which will correspond statistically to a mean preserving spread of estimated values. So basically, the whole question boils down to a comparative statics with respect to that distribution G 
which was distribution of consumer values. And it turns out to be uh, quite tractable, but still, even for simplicity, for the purpose of the talk, let's focus on a one-dimensional class of mean-preserving spreads, which are characterized by accuracy. And accuracy can be anything between 0 and 1. If accuracy is 0, you get no information about the value. Your posterior is equal to the prior. If you have accuracy equal to 1, you have perfect information about the value. So your posterior distribution uh, is, uh, is equal to the true distribution of values. And anywhere in between, you have in some sense scaled version between full, full information uh, and no information. Uh, as you know, in the literature, this kind of uh, uh, main preserving spreads can be generated by true for noise signals that equal the true probability alpha and equal to the noise alpha probability. So what is the impact of this data provision to algorithms? On one hand, this is straightforward. Higher precision, high, better algorithm performance, increased by our surplus, because this is what we're trying to maximize. On the other hand, impact on price is a bit more subtle, because on one hand, the higher precision leads to discovery at more high value matches. And so you want to actually serve the, this high value uh, products to the consumer, even if they are costly to produce. So you want to incorporate, include more uh, uh, higher seller costs, and this would lead to increase of prices. And because there's uh, asymmetry of information, there's private information for the seller, you don't know uh, his or her costs, this effect will propagate across all price and post. On the other hand, high precision, you can also exclude more of low value matches because you've, you've found that it's not a good fit and this will lead to in some sense decrease of prices especially at the lower end because before they were served full, uh, full uh, probability one now there will be some exclusion you will be forcing uh, to decrease the price you know, not forcing but incentivizing which effect dominates depends on the nature of information rents and what we will show that it will uh, depend on the curvature of virtual costs so what results we have is that if algorithm accuracy increases, then the bias expected payoff increases. But at the same time, the highest equilibrium price will always increase. So equilibrium will always, market will be always be accommodating more high, higher prices. At the same time, the effect of other prices depends on uh, curvature of virtual cost. If the virtual costs are convex, then the lowest equilibrium price will decrease. So in this sense, actually, we will be observing the higher price range in equilibrium. However, if the virtual costs are concave, then each, each seller type, post, uh, type will be posting higher price. So the, in some sense, there will be uniform shift uh, towards higher prices in equilibrium. And this is quite uh, interesting, I find. Uh, and again, uh, yes, this is just summarizing, but important observation from here is that, say, if virtual costs are concave, it will be the, so that increase in consumer surplus will be by accompanied by an increase in prices. So in some sense, uh, uh, if the consumers are guarded by algorithmic consumption, this is what we might expect uh, when the data becomes more abundant. Uh, let, this is just illustration for our uniform example. I guess the more interesting part of it is this. So these are equilibrium pricing strategies that happen uh, uh, when we increase the uh, precision of data. If, if the data is absolutely imprecise, then in fact the only uh, uh, price of one quarter will be sustained in equilibrium. If the uh, precision is one, this is the case what we studied before. Uh, then there will be uh, serves the cost between zero and half, and progressively higher cost will be posting progressively higher prices. But in what happened interestingly, if alpha is 0.5, so you can identify but not perfectly the value, then there will be bunching on the price one quarter, and there will be a range of prices posted above one quarter. And as precision increases, as you can see, A, more uh, seller costs are involved in the trade, but B, the minimum equilibrium cost remains the same, 
And this is because uh, for uniform distribution, virtual costs are both convex and concave. So both uh, parts of proposition applies. But then the uh, other prices uh, are increasing. So this is quite interesting uh, illustrated. OK, good. And now let's briefly talk to about providing more data to the self, which is very important regulatory uh, concern. Uh, uh, you can think of it as personalized pricing, market segmentation, etc. So basically, we will allow the seller to price in different market segments and algorithm be a segment specific, which is what the optimal algorithm should be. And we would like to understand what are the effects of finer market segmentation. And we can model this scenario uh, by market segments, as usually is, uh, done in the literature, corresponding to a realization of some informative signal about the evaluation of the buyer. And for simplicity, let's assume that this is again true for noise signal. And the algorithm can adapt to the signal realization. So the finer segmentation corresponds to high accuracy of alpha. So what happens when, when you provide data about consumers? Naturally, in more profitable segments, the seller will charge higher prices. In the less profitable segments, the seller will charge lower prices. Uh, in a sense, therefore, higher accuracy makes the prices more correlated with values. So there is, will be greater surplus equality across the consumers, because the high value consumers will be uh, extract the surplus more than low value consumers. However, of course, the usual concerns wouldn't this information leakage actually harm consumers? So they are equal in poverty, as people were a little bit like in USSR. You know, they're, they're equal, but they're all in poverty. Uh, rephrasing the question can algorithm consumption actually countervail price discrimination? And this turns out to be yes. And this formalized in this proposition. As the seller's data accuracy increases, A, the distribution of equilibrium prices undergoes a mean preserving spread. So average price remains the same, but it's more dispersed because it matches close to the value. But B, uh, the distribution of buyer's payoffs undergoes a mean preserving contraction. And, but again, the, that means that the buyer's expected payoff remains the same, yet uh, it's less variable. And the key to that, and I'm almost done, uh, is the fact that the equilibrium allocation actually doesn't depend on segment at all. Because the equilibrium allocation doesn't depend on distribution of valuation within the segment. Uh, it, it always allocated if B is greater than uh, virtual cost. Therefore, by the payoff equivalence theorem, the sellers and buyers expected payoff should be invariant to accuracy. And we can calculate similarly that the average price remains the same. However, this, there's this greater surplus equality, and this corresponds to mean preserving construction in our city. And in some sense, the takeaway here that algorithmic consumption can perfectly negate price discrimination. And this is, in some sense, again, we think of algorithmic consumption as a tool, potential tool, uh, to uh, empower consumers. Okay, good. Um, so this is just related literature, right? The, I think we contribute to this uh, recent live and uh, uh, evolving literature on empowering buyers, uh, buyers and countervailing power, on data availability and price discrimination. And I think importantly, there is this recent literature in economics that's thinking more and more about welfare distribution effects of different mechanisms. And I think here uh, our results in data, uh, in price discrimination session, section speak to that. Because basically it turns the lemons into a lemonade. Something usually uh, perceived as bad can actually help to redistribute surplus. Okay, let me summarize what we study in this work. With, we study strategic algorithm design in a very classic monopoly setting. Uh, we characterize a by optimal algorithm. We show that it does intentional errors. We show that high algorithm precision can increase both prices and consumer surplus. And at the same time, the personalized pricing doesn't decrease consumer surplus, but redistributes well, welfare. Uh, kind of a takeaway, I think, uh, you know, uh, is to that algorithm consumption can be viewed as a countervailing force uh, against uh, monopoly power. And thinking, you know, a little bit further and where this 
kind of we started thinking about this question why because there's this development in artificial intelligence which clearly will be impacting our lives and the real intelligence should be strategic so artificial intelligence is not only computer science but also game theory and i think economists have a lot to contribute to, to this topic thank you very much I think we have time for one question. So we generally assume quality is constant in these models. Price changes, quality is constant. Um, I wonder, uh, I'm suggesting an extension to your model, which will complexify it dramatically, but I'm wondering this because I've been sitting here thinking, am I actually implementing in my day-to-day -day life a version of this algorithm based upon uncertainties in quality, um, both the quality of a product being offered. Uh, uh, I don't know that from I'm yeah. thinking buying on Amazon. I don't really know if this is a high quality product or not. I just know the price, reviews yes. are meaningless, and the seller doesn't really know based upon the price. Am I uh, uh, looking for a high quality product or uh, a cheap product? Um, so uh, my question is, have you thought about how uh, a quality variable could affect the strategic element here, where a consumer, me, might not have a specific quality in mind. I want a higher quality product, but I would be uh, happy to get a decent quality product at a low price or a high quality product at that same low price. Yes. Uh, okay, great question. So, so the last part that you mentioned, you know, high quality product at a, at a high price or low quality, low price, this is exactly matches to this value price mm -hmm. uh, uh, discussion, right? Because you can think where the, we are a bit uh, abstract in a way where the value comes from and it can come perfectly clearly from the quality of the product, but also from the consumer's interest in this particular attributes of the product. So, you know, basically here it boils down into one variable, but it, you can totally think of it as coming from the quality. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, we can easily accommodate, um, in some sense, how different quality distribution can affect. Because this change in value distribution, which we studied, came from the uh, algorithm being more precise, it can also come from simply products getting better. And we can totally analyze the effects on the on the al optimal algorithm here. The second part of your question, I think, is uh, uh, concerns moral hazard and it, perhaps investment in quality from the seller side, if I understood correctly, that would, that would be more complicated to implement because then you need to think what also response uh, in terms of the quality provision on top of price will be. Interesting extension. We did, about that, we didn't think. But yes, totally, oh, very good. Yes? Suppose that we regulated uh, who provided these consumer algorithms. Uh, yes. Wouldn't another threat be just marketing by sellers? Because they would also know that there are trades that are being left on the table. So if you had a single monopolist, it seems like, you know, even if there's a single search provider, I, I would want to bombard you with right. information about trades that we're leaving on the table. Yes. So, the, you know, uh, one, one could think about this direction. One difficulty for that for sellers would be that all sellers, irrespective of quality, would like to bombard, right? And therefore, that might not be very informative. And what we show, actually, our results extend to the possibility when the, the buyer can always purchase a product but don't know about the quality. But there's a single but, seller, right? Right, yeah. But you can think about this continuum of sellers for continuum of products. It's the same, the same idea. But uh, so, so how to how to say it, in some sense, the fact that you are not recommended by the algorithm can, can give sufficiently strong signal about quality of particular product that the buyer, even if advertised, would not be willing to, to, to interest in the product. So in this sense, I think there is some guard against this kind of direct leakage, but it can, uh, in other markets it can affect, but it needs to be then incorporated in the design of the algorithm. So okay. algorithm should be, in some sense, strategic enough to incorporate that part. To incorporate the possibility, possibility that the seller yes. could still send an additional exactly. message. Exactly, yes. It will just make it perhaps more complex and it will start to hurt the buyers. Okay. But yes, certainly, yeah. Another interesting question. Well, thank you very much, Alex. We'll love thank to wrap much. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. One piece of housekeeping, the uh, word for continuing legal education at the end is design. 
And more importantly, now is the time for lunch. Uh, lunch is served outside. Um, I would normally invite you to welcome you to eat in the courtyard, but the weather is not exactly inviting for that today. But if you're so inclined, you're welcome to do so. And we will reconvene at 1.30 for Joanne's Cup. <clears throat>
will modify the, so the, the, the way in the in the in the in the way the the changes in the way they access the media uh, will can change their behavior. So this is uh, some information about the Spanish uh, media market. Uh, so we analyzed the market uh, for the period between 2005 and 2021, and as you can see, the uh, the, the readership of uh, uh, Spanish consumers have not decreased that much. So the, the gray line show uh, changes in the, in the readership, uh, and it has always been around the, the 42%. The blue line uh, shows the, the, the uh, readers or the percentage of the Spanish population that read uh, a print newspaper. And it has been, as you can see, it has been an important decrease. And the red line shows the percentage of the Spanish population that reads an online newspaper, and it has increased, increased in an important way. And the yellow line is the, the percentage of the population that multi-home, that is, that use uh, both a print and an online uh, news outlet. Uh, what, what do you mean by an online news outlet? If a, a print newspaper has a online version, and I read both, is that multi-homing? Is that reading one or the other? Or how do you define online? Well, Multi-homing is when uh, readers read more than one uh, news outlet. And uh, online version is uh, so. There are so uh, I will explain this. Explain this now. So there are some uh, traditional uh, print uh, newspapers that then uh, also have created a, a digital edition, and there are also some uh, newspapers that has always been digital because they have been created in this way. And the former, do you count those as print? online or multi-homing? Yeah, so I will explain this okay. now in more detail because the paper is a bit about this, so we want to understand how this is changing the, the strategies of the advertisers. So here the idea is that, well, there is, the readership has not changed that much, but the way in which consumers access newspapers has changed. So now the question is, well, this has uh, any implication for the advertisers, how advertisers uh, have adjusted to this change? Now, uh, this is uh, some information about the multi-homing in the Spanish market. So as I said, uh, multi-homing uh, is, is a, a, a term that we, we use in, econ in economics to explain when uh, users are, uh, consumers are using different platforms. So in this case, we can uh, consider uh, multi-homing in the situation in which consumers are using more than uh, one newspaper. So the, the blue line shows a multi-homing in the case of the print and newspaper. So this is uh, the percentage of the readers that were accessing more than one newspaper. And as you can, you can see, with this digitalization, the percentage has decreased. The red line is the, the percentage of the readers, not all the to of, of, of the total population, this is the percentage of the readers that uh, multi-home in online newspapers. And you can see that the percentage has increased. And the gray line uh, um, shows the, the percentage of the readers that multi-home in, in a print and in an online uh, newspaper. So this means the, the, the percentage of the readers that at least read one print newspaper and one online newspaper. We can also analyze in more detail these changes. Uh, so these changes in the behavior of the readers uh, of the Spanish uh, newspapers. Then this is for the case of uh, printed uh, newspapers, and we can see that the, the, this gray line, which is the percentage of the readers that uh, read more than one uh, regional newspaper, and the red line is the percentage of the readers that read more than one national newspaper. So there is more multi-homing in the case of regional newspapers than in the case of national newspapers. Now we analyze the same thing, but for the case of the online newspapers, then we see that the, the, the red line, which is the percentage of readers that read more than one national newspaper, and the gray uh, line, which is the percentage of the readers of online newspapers that read more than one regional newspapers. So, uh, so this indicates that in the case of uh, online readers, there is a more multi-homing for national newspapers. And there is also multi-homing uh, in, in, 
the, uh, in uh, national and regional newspapers. So we don't show this here in this figure for simplicity, but there are also many readers that, uh, that access an, uh, a national and uh, sports and uh, regional newspapers uh, every day. All right. So what we want to analyze is how these changes in the uh, in multi-homing affects advertisers. So consider this situation. So this is, uh, uh, imagine a, a situation in which there are three uh, regional newspapers and one big uh, national newspaper. So the, the, the black circle represents these national newspapers. So the area of all these circles are the, potent, the, are the audiences of all these uh, regional and national newspapers. So you, you can see that in this case, the overlap of the audience is not very important. The, the overlap of the audiences between regional and with, between the regional and the national newspapers. So in this case, what we could expect is that advertisers will want to uh, uh, use to, to, to place their ad in all the uh, newspapers in order to reach all the consumers. So if the multi-homing is, is, uh, is not very important, what we will uh, expect is that and then it will be more multi-homing about uh, the advertisers. Now consider this case. So in this case, we have still three uh, regional newspapers and one big, now is a bigger uh, national uh, newspaper in terms of audience. And now there is more uh, multi-homing. So there is more overlapping in the audiences. So in this case, now advertisers could prefer to just to uh, place their ads in the national newspapers in order to avoid the, the duplication of costs. So uh, now they don't need to place advertisement in all the, uh, in all the outlets in order to uh, reach most of the, of the consumers. Uh, of course, there are some uh, things that we should also consider in this case. For example, maybe uh, advertisers have a, a, a local or regional audience. So in this case, maybe they will still prefer to go to the local newspaper regional newspaper. Or it could be that uh, the advertiser's willingness to pay is very high, and then they will still want to multi-home. But the idea is that, well, if there is a multi-homing of readers, then maybe, uh, so if there is a lot of multi-homing for the readers, maybe um, advertisers or a part of the advertisers will prefer to single home. And if uh, there is a lot of multi-homing, uh, uh, sorry, if there is um, less multi-homing of readers, then advertisers will want to multi-home. So this is uh, the, the idea, or one of the ideas that we want to analyze in our paper. And, and, and in the data, all of the newspapers and the media outlets use the same language? Not all, but most of them. But uh, we take this into account. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we, we consider, for example, we consider we consider uh, fifty-eight um, online newspapers, and maybe uh, six of them uh, use Catalan. Maybe one use use uh, Basque, which is the language in the Basque country, and maybe uh, one of them use uh, um, uh, the the language that is speak, uh, spoken in another region in Spain. So how do you determine the sample of the newspaper, like by their popularity, or it's a... Yeah, so um, the sample of the newspaper uh, is uh, because of the, it's based on the circulation. So we have used, uh, we have used the, 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 all the newspapers that have a large cir uh, circulation, uh, and also uh, that have a, la a large number of visits uh, in the websites. So, okay. and, and, uh, but more or less, uh, this will represent uh, maybe the 90% of all the readership in Spain. All right, so which are the, the goals of, uh, of, of this paper? So first, what we want to do is to analyze how the digitalization of the media market has affected the, uh, readers, the reader's behavior, how uh, has affected, for example, multi-homing. And the second objective is to analyze how the changes in the reader's behavior has modified the uh, advertiser's uh, strategies. 
In order to do this, uh, we use the following empirical uh, strategy. So first, we exploit the quasi-exogenous deployment of broadband lines across the Spanish provinces um, in the period be between 2007 and 2021 to examine this relationship between the use of internet in Spain and uh, multi-homing. And second, uh, we use a very detailed, I will explain now that, uh, the, the, all the, the details of this, we, we use a very detailed data set about the activity of uh, advertisers in Spain in order to analyze how these changes in, in multi-homing and in general changes in the behavior of readers have affected the strategies of the advertisers. So the main takeaways of the, of the paper, which is still in a very uh, preliminary version, so we have, just, we have just started to analyze all the data and uh, derive conclusions. Today I'm not going to explain uh, all the results that we have obtained, because as, as you will see we have many results and we, have, we are trying to, to, to see what is the, what, which are the results that uh, are better to, to explain the, what we want to explain. But the, 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 for the moment, the main takeaways uh, that we have um, identified is that uh, the use of internet uh, has increased uh, the number of users that use uh, online newspapers and the multi-homing of uh, readers between print and uh, online uh, newspapers. And the use of internet has also increased the multi-homing uh, of online national uh, newspapers. Um, on the other hand, we will see that the use of internet and the homing has decreased the advertisers' spending in print uh, newspapers, and it has increased the, advertising, uh, the advertisers' spending in online uh, newspapers. And then we will see that uh, uh, the newspapers that has been more affected by this change in the um, behavior of readers are uh, the, the regional newspapers. So can I ask a qualified question related to the previous one? Uh, so if the same user uses the online and printed version of the same journal and yes. only that, how do you qualify this user? So this will be a, a, a reader that multi-homes between the, an online uh, and a print. Uh, I see, of the same paper. journal, so it will be still counting as multi home. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. Because advertisers have to choose, so advertisers may decide in only uh, place ads in the print version, only in the online version, on the, uh, or in the two of them. And they can also put more it effort in It depends on the strategy of the pu 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 publishers, right? Because it could be that publisher just allows only uh, advertising on both. It could be, uh, in principle, we don't expect that uh, uh, publishers um, generate some uh, agreements uh, that only allow consumers to, to, to advertise in the two types of newspapers. We don't think that this happens. It's a possibility, but we don't have information for this. Okay. Another thing that uh, we are not uh, contemplating yet, but uh, we hope to, to be able to work in the future, is that, that um, the changes in uh, the behavior of advertisers can modify also the prices. And now we are collecting information about the prices. So uh, publishers may try to react to these uh, changes in the advertising uh, expenditures by modifying the prices. Uh, are you considering like the fact that many newspapers are creating podcasts or like video content so advertisers might target? We don't have information about the specific contents that are offering the newspapers. The information that we have is aggregated uh, and, and, and we don't know exactly the type of contents that may, they may offer. They may be offering. Um, the only thing is that we assume that these changes should uh, uniformly affect all the newspapers. All right, so before uh, showing you more details about the data and about our results, let me say you a few things about the digitalization of the Spanish media market. 
So the first uh, Spanish uh, digital market was created in the year, uh, sorry, the, fir the first Spanish uh, uh, digital uh, newspaper was created in the year uh, 1994. So this was a traditional newspaper, uh, or a couple of uh, traditional newspapers that decided to create the online version uh, of the, their uh, outlet. Then in the year uh, 1995 uh, uh, was created the first uh, digital native uh, Spanish newspaper. Then in the, in the following years, um, newspapers were experimenting with different configurations. Uh, they were also experimenting with different, uh, different uh, business models. So some of them introduced to some paywalls, others are not. Uh, most of, but at the end of this period, more or less all the uh, newspapers converged to the same structure, and also most of them were uh, advertising uh, finance. So were mostly financed with the advertisements of the of the advertisers. Then. In the next decade, uh, there were some important changes in the market. First, after se September 11 of 2001, was an important change in the, in the newspapers, affecting not only the Spanish newspapers, but the, the newspapers in general. And this is that uh, newspapers uh, started to introduce continuous updates of their contents and also breaking news. So you have to imagine that in the, in the previous peri period, the, the, the online, online newspapers were, were basically the online version of the uh, printed newspapers. So they were exactly like a PDF of the, of the, of the printed uh, newspaper. But uh, in, the, in this uh, decade, in the 2000s, uh, newspapers uh, become to uh, update their contents uh, continuously in the, during the day. Then in the year 2004 was the eruption of uh, online platforms like uh, YouTube, uh, Google Search, uh, Facebook. And then this also transformed the, the, the market. And uh, it began uh, this period of the citizen journalism in which the contents that are offered by the newspapers also is a reaction of how uh, the, the, the consumers are using them. So um, for example, in the case, uh, so you see if, if uh, um, uh, newspapers observe that uh, they have a lot of traffic from uh, Google search, maybe they will, uh, for some particular piece of news, maybe they will uh, try to complement the information that they are giving for this particular piece of news and updating their, their content. In the next uh, decade, um, there were also important changes in the, in the market. So in the next decade, in the 2010s, then it was a, a eruption, the, the, the eruption of the competition of uh, news aggregators and social media, uh, which has taken away some of the visits that receive uh, online newspapers. And as a consequence, as a consequence of this, uh, newspapers have uh, changed their business model, and now there are many uh, newspapers that use a paywall. This is also the, the period in which uh, the newspapers started to modify their contents in order in order to make them more uh, accessible, uh, more, more available for uh, the users of uh, smartphones. And also in this decade is when uh, was the beginning of the programmatic advertising. So there were also there were there were not only changes on the side of the pub publishers, but also changes in the in this on the side of the uh, advertising market in the sense that. Uh, Many advertisers started to use uh, programmatic advertising. Now, in the in the twenties, uh, there have also been some important changes in the market. Uh, one of them is the use of the artificial intelligence in order to produce and to manage uh, contents. And and also uh, now there are uh, many newspapers that use recommendation systems or social platforms that use recommendation systems. As this is al this is also something that, that is going to to modify this market. So this is our, the, these are the main changes that has um, uh, followed this uh, sector. This is as an illustration of how the numbers of uh, digital uh, um, newspapers uh, has changed over the, the period that we analyze. So the, the blue line are the legacy digital media. So th these are the, the newspapers that 
began as a printed newspaper and then they made the transformation to become an online newspaper. And uh, the, the red line uh, are the digital native uh, newspapers. So here we consider not only newspapers, so we, here we also consider uh, uh, radios and uh, TV stations, uh, magazines. So this is the whole media market. All right, so let me explain you the data that we use um, in the analysis. So first, we use data about the deployment of uh, broadband lines in Spain uh, from 2007 to 2021. This is uh, annual data. And as you can see, at, and this is provided by the Spanish regulator of the telecommunications market. You can see that uh, in this period, um, uh, this has been a substitution from the uh, very simple broadband lines that, that were based on the XDSL to lines that are based on, on the fiber technology and the cable technology. So in this period, there is an increase in the number of broadband lines, but it has also been a technological substitution. Um, we also have data annual data at the province level on the reader's uh, behavior. So we, we have access to uh, a survey that analyzes for each province the number of uh, newspapers that are reading all the uh, consumers. And this is an information that is very useful for us because uh, it, it, it allows us to analyze how consumers have substituted printed for online newspapers but also, this allows us to analyze how many print uh, newspapers are reading the users and how many online newspapers are reading them. With this information, we are able to create our uh, measures or multi-homing. Then we have our measures on, on multi-homing of, uh, of readers that read print and online newspapers, our measures of uh, multi-homing of the readers that print, uh, print, uh, print newspapers, they can read uh, more than one print newspaper, uh, they can read more than one national print newspaper or regional print newspaper, and we also create our measures on um, the multi-homing in for online newspapers. And again, it could be the readers read uh, more than one regional newspaper, more than one national newspaper, and this is how we, uh, with these measures, we are able to analyze uh, the changes in the market. So today, I'm not going to analyze results for all these measures, because there are too many. Uh, we will focus mostly on the multi-homing between uh, print and online newspapers, and we will focus on the multi-homing on online newspapers. Do you want me to ask a question? Yes. The readership data, is that individual data or household data? The, uh, so this is a, so the, so the, the data set that is above, this is a, a, a survey that considers, so this is a survey that is, a, is, a, is, a ref, is an important survey in Spain, and for each province they uh, uh, want to know how many people in the, in the province uh, read a particular newspaper. How many individuals? How many individuals? Because I'm wondering, because the broadband on, on a fixed line basis, mobile tends to be individual, but fixed line adoption is usually done at the household level. Exactly, but what we do, so yeah, so what we do is, uh, so we also have uh, uh, information uh, on the, in the individual adoption of, of internet. So with, in this survey, we have uh, information on the individual adoption of internet, and then we can know in each province how many uh, readers are using internet. Thank you. So we have, uh, on the one hand, we have information about the deployment of uh, broadband at the province level, and then we also have information at the province level, but from this source, about the percentage of the population that is using internet and the percentage of the population that uh, reads and, uh, online newspapers. Uh, then we have uh, the, the data set that is below, uh, and this is a, a data set that uh, shows what is the circulation of print newspapers. So we, we know for each province um, uh, what is the circulation of uh, all the Spanish newspapers. 
Then uh, in this case, we have uh, information for 88 print uh, outlets, and then we classify, in general, we classify uh, newspapers uh, in four groups, national, regional, business, and sports, right? Then this information is, already, is also very useful because uh, this information allows us to, to better uh, identify what are the audiences of the regional newspapers in, uh, in Spain, not only for the print news, uh, for the, the, the circulation of the print newspapers, but this, we also use this information in order to calculate the potential audiences of online newspapers, of regional, regional online newspapers. Next, uh, we also have a, a very nice and detailed data set about the behavior of uh, advertisers. And then uh, this is daily information. We have daily information on the ads that advertisers are placing in different uh, print and online newspapers. We have information for the period that we uh, uh, analyze, we have information on 162,000 advertisers that advertise their products in 52 uh, print outlets and about uh, uh, 52,000 uh, advertisers that advertise their products in uh, online uh, outlets. Uh, advertisers are categorized, can be categorized, so we have the names of all of them, we have all the information, but they can be categorized in 20 sectors. And as I said, we can also uh, classify um, outlets according to uh, their, their reach, so it could be national, regional, business, or sports newspaper. Regarding the advertising uh, in print uh, in, in media, then in this case, uh, we have a lot of information. We have uh, the, the position of the advertisement in the newspaper. So the, the advertisement could be in the in the cover, in the back cover, in an event page, in, a, in an odd page. So we have a, this type of information for all the advertisements. Uh, and we ha also have uh, information about how much uh, this advertisement uh, costs to the advertisers. So we have information about the uh, advertisers spending on, this, on each particular ad in each particular uh, newspaper. For the moment, what we, what we are doing is to uh, aggregate this uh, information at the at the year level. Yes. Quick question: Does this include both advertising that is sold directly to the newspapers and through programmatic advertising? Yes. Yeah. So for the moment, we uh, we are not distinguishing. So so this was referred about the, the advertisements in print newspapers, but we are, we have the same information for the advertisements in online newspapers. For the moment, uh, we can uh, not distinguish uh, if uh, was this advertisements, these ads, if these ads were directly uh, contracted with the publisher or with uh, programmatic advertising, but we are collecting information on this and I think that we could uh, do some analysis for at least for four years. Yes. In the advertisers, how are you differentiating the ones that I are could happen in both, both print and online? Do they count as two different ones or just the one? So we know for each advertiser, if they place advertisements in online and in print newspaper, what we do is to aggregate this information at the, at the year and outlet level. But, but we have this information. So essentially what we have is all the information about the advertisers in print and online newspapers in Spain. This is daily information. For the moment, we are not exploiting this information at the daily level. We are aggregating the information uh, because the, uh, the multi-homing information that we have is also at the year level. Right. Um, and that's it. So we have uh, also for the online uh, newspapers uh, the ads that are placed in the, in the front uh, page of the website or in other pages. And we also know what is the spending of the advertisers in each of these uh, uh, outlets. All right, so this is the data that we use, and as you can see, the, the information that we have about the advertisers is very rich. Uh, so this is just a little bit to, to illustrate uh, with, with our, which have been the main changes in the market. So the blue line represents 
uh, the advertisers spending in print newspapers, in 22 print newspapers in Spain, and the red line uh, is the, uh, advertise, the spending of the advertisers in, on, in 58 uh, online newspapers. It's also interesting to see how the number of uh, advertisers has changed, because something that is interesting is that, well, advertisers have changed their strategies regarding where to place their ads, but some advertisers are not uh, advertising their pro products anymore in newspapers. So this is the number of advertisers in print and online newspapers. And you, as you can see, so in the last years, the number of advertisers in online newspapers has increased, importantly, but still they are below the number of advertisers in the print newspapers. So this could be for many, for so many reasons. This, this could be because uh, they have other alternatives to advertise their products in other uh, online platforms. This could be because uh, changes in the prices. This could be because um, um, it's too complex for them to, to, to place an advertisement in, a, in an online newspaper. So there are different explanations for this that we have not investigated yet. No, but, uh, so, but these are the general trends in the, in the market. All right, so let me uh, explain you which are the results that we find. So, so we have several uh, hypotheses, but as I said, we are now working on this, and, and I, will, I will explain you some of our preliminary uh, results and hypotheses. But of course, we are we will be, we will be very glad to receive your comments on this because we are to, we are just starting to digest all this information. So the first uh, hypothesis is that the deployment of broadband telecommunications lines is what explains the expansion in the use of internet. A second ex um, hypothesis is that the, digital the digitalization has reduced the multi-homing in print newspapers. Um, so this is because print newspapers are expensive. So now that we have access to online newspapers, so maybe we will still buy some print newspapers, but uh, in many occasions we will uh, access information or access for news in online newspapers because they are free. Um, the third hypothesis is that the digitalization has favored the um, multi-homing uh, of readers in print and in online newspapers. And it has increased the multi-homing of uh, um, readers in online newspapers. So the idea is that now it's, it's uh, less costly to access newspapers. For this reason, newspaper, uh, newspapers may receive more visits from, from readers. And also because now there are some news aggregators, uh, social networks that may um, increase the total number of visits that receive uh, some small newspapers that otherwise will not have uh, obtained these videos. So in order to analyze the, uh, this uh, hypothesis, what we do is to exploit uh, the, the, the quasi-exogenous variation that generates the deployment of um, the broadband lines in the Spanish provinces. Um, and then we use this. Uh, to analyze how the internet, the use of internet has modified uh, multi-homing at the level of the Spanish provinces. So, but, uh, but for this, an important assumption that we have to make is that the, the, this uh, deployment of broadband lines was independent of, uh, on the preferences of readers to, uh, to read uh, online newspapers. So in order to, to use uh, this uh, exogenous variation, to consider that this, there was this exogenous variation in the deployment of broadlands, we need to consider that this wasn't related to the changes in the uh, behavior of the readers. Uh, we have some uh, analysis for this. Uh, this is when we aggregate uh, the deployment of broadband in the Spanish provinces, we aggregate them according to the sites. Then we see that uh, 
the changes uh, so that the share of the bro uh, broadband lines in the total population uh, is very similar across the different uh, provinces, regardless of the size of these provinces. But maybe what is more important is that uh, when we analyze the changes in the in the um, deployment of the broad lines uh, per person in each province, we see that the, these uh, these uh, changes. No, this is the the last the last three columns. These changes in the in the deployment uh, doesn't seem related with the size of the of the provinces. So this is one important aspect uh, because. Uh, so what we are going to do is to use the, the broadband, uh, so the deployment of the broadband lines as an instrument for the internet use in order to analyze how changes in the internet use have changed multi-homing. And this is the model that we are going to estimate. So uh, in, in the question one, what you have is uh, the, uh, this regression that uh, analyzes all the changes in the number of lines have changed uh, the use of internet. And in this uh, model, we consider uh, province and uh, period uh, fixed effects. Then in equation two, what we do is to analyze how the changes in the use of internet has changed the percentage of the, of the readers that use an on, online newspaper and have changed uh, multi-homing. But for this, in order to avoid uh, endogeneity and, uh, in the, for, for internet use, in this, um, in this equation, what we do is uh, we estimate this model uh, as an instrumental variable model, and we use the, the equation one as the first stage of the, of the, um, of the estimation, in which uh, the, the instrument for the internet use is the number of broken lines. All right. So in this equation, we also consider uh, province fixed effects and periods fixed effects. And these are the results that we obtain for the first re um, regression, for the first equation. So what we see is that the deployment of uh, broadband lines increased the use of internet, but in a decreasing way. So that for higher values of uh, the deployment, then we observe uh, uh, dec uh, decreasing increases in the, in the in use of internet. And in the third column, we see the whole, the, uh, so this is the, the third column is the result of the instrumental variable uh, regressions. And here we see how the changes in the use of internet change the percentage of the population that use it, uh, or the percentage of the readers that use it uh, online uh, newspapers. Then we see that a 1% increase in the use of internet across the Spanish population increases, increases by more or less 1% the percentage of the readers that use it, an online newspaper. Uh, next, what we do is to analyze how the, the use of internet, how the use of internet affected multi-homing of readers in print and um, online newspapers. And here what we see is that uh, the increase in the use of internet uh, had a positive effect in the multi-homing in print and in online newspapers. Next, what we do is to analyze how the increase in the use of internet, so now we are, uh, I'm presenting the results for the instrumental variable um, estimation. So now, what we do is to analyze how the increase in the use of uh, internet does it, that is instrumented with the number of uh, broad, li broad lines is affecting multi-homing. And here what we see is that uh, multi-homing in print newspapers uh, decreased, importantly. But this decrease was more important in the case of regional newspapers than in the case of national newspapers or in the case of the multi-homing between national and regional newspapers. So the use of internet reduced multi-homing in print newspapers, but more in regional newspapers. 
Now, we do the same exercise for the case of the online newspapers. And what we see is that the use of internet increases multi-homing in online newspapers, but uh, this increase was more important in the case of uh, national newspapers, national online newspapers, than in the case of the regional online newspapers. So what this means is that the use of internet reduced multi-homing in print uh, newspapers, but more in the case of regional newspapers. And the use of internet increased the multi-homing in the online newspapers, but less in the case of regional newspapers. Yes, Kevin? For your data on the advertisers, are you able to see whether they're advertising some like very local stores or events? That is, those are the people who might want, a, if they're lo advertising like a, you know, a, product, a natural product versus some kind of local events. Because right? those advertisements, you might want to place them into more regional newspapers, right? So the differential effect of this on national versus regional. Right? We, we could uh, try to analyze this because we, we, we know have the names of the advertisers and right, right, right. You, you were saying you can put them into 20 categories. I wasn't sure whether that's granular enough for you to figure out like are they advertising something of national interest versus this is something very So it will be interesting to see which are the the, the, the heterogeneous effects across. Uh, right. But here uh, we are still considering um, consumers, readers, and this is how the use of internet affects the readers behavior and what we see is that uh, uh, so these changes are different across uh, regional and national newspapers. And now I will explain to you how the changes in the reader's behavior affect the uh, advertiser's uh, multi-homing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so what you say is, is possible with our data. Uh, next, uh, let me see this. So next, uh, I will explain to you, uh, we, so we also analyze how the, the, um, the changes in the, in the use of internet and the changes in the percentage of the readers that read an online uh, newspaper have affected the sales of print newspapers. And this is the model that we estimate also with the instrumental variables using broadband as an, as an instrument. And in this case, we have a, a, fixed effect at the, pro at the province and outlet level, and also uh, period fixed effect. Then the results that we find is that uh, the increase in the use of internet reduced uh, reduce the number of sales uh, of uh, print newspapers. And in particular, one in, one in, a 1% 1 increase in the use of internet reduced uh, the sales of um, of uh, print newspapers by 1.6%. When we analyze the effects of these changes across different types of newspapers, then what we see is that these uh, changes uh, were more important in the case of national uh, newspapers than in the case of regional newspapers. So this is the general, so this coefficient is the general effect, and then we are using our business outlets as a, as a reference. Then this is, is, these are the heterogeneous effects across different types of uh, news outlets. Right. Uh, so finally, what we do is to uh, analyze how the changes in the behavior of readers affected the behavior of advertisers or the advertisers' strategies. Um, we do this uh, in three different ways. Uh, so we analyze uh, the impact at the advertiser outlet and year level. We analyze this at the outlet and year level and at the advertiser and year level. So first I'm going to present you the results at the advertiser, outlet and year and year level. And this is the question that we are going to, to estimate. So we analyze how the change in the use of internet uh, changes the spending of the advertisers at the advertiser uh, outlet level. So this means how the change of advertisers per uh, each outlet uh, was affected by the use of internet. Uh, we uh, have uh, fixed effects at the level of the advertiser and the outlet, and uh, fixed effect at the period level as well. And we control for circulation of the newspaper. So the results that we have are the following. So. This is for the 
print newspapers. So what we see is that the, the change uh, uh, in the use of internet, so the increase in the use of internet reduced uh, the spending of the advertisers, but this is, was not the case in the case of the national print newspapers, because as, as you see, this coefficient is larger than this one. So this means that the change in the use of internet modified advertisers' uh, spending, but this was not for national newspapers, but was, this was the case for regional newspapers. Now, the, the, uh, the change in the multi-homing, uh, in the print on online multi-homing, uh, reduced the spending of print newspapers. Uh, and this was a uh, general result. And the, the, the change in the multi-homing of online uh, readers uh, reduced advertisers' uh, spending. In the case of uh, online newspapers, we find uh, opposite results. So the use of internet is positively related with the spending, the spending of the advertisers. The multi-homing in print and online newspapers is positively related with uh, uh, the spending of the advertisers. But this change is uh, less important for the regional newspapers. And uh, multi-homing uh, in online newspapers is also positively related uh, with uh, the, the spending tour of uh, the advertisers, but um, this change is more important for national online newspapers and a little, bit, a, a little bit more important for regional newspapers. Uh, finally, we also analyze um, how the changes in the reader's uh, behavior affected the revenues of the outlets. Uh, and in this case, what we analyze is how the change in the use of internet and the change in multi-homing affected the advertising revenues of the news outlets. Uh, in this case, we use uh, uh, outlets fixed effects and, and uh, period fixed effects. Then the results that we find is that in the case of the print newspaper, uh, internet, uh, we don't find a, any, an impact in the, uh, in the revenues of uh, newspapers, except in the case of the sports newspapers. So the sports newspapers were the, the, the ones that had a larger uh, reduction in their uh, advertising revenues with the increase of digitalization. And one explanation for this is that these were the, the newspapers that were more subject to the multi-homing of, uh, of uh, the readers. So uh, if uh, readers were using uh, online sports newspapers, they will not buy uh, an a sports print newspaper. So they were more affected by this change in the, in the, in the revenues. Uh, we also have information about the impact in the number of um, uh, advertisers that they had and about the concentration of the advertising revenues but I will not explain this for the moment uh, unless you have interest in seeing all the details and now I explain which was the impact of the internet use and multi-homing in the advertising revenues of the online newspapers then we, what we observe is that uh, internet use increased the um, advertising revenues of newspapers but uh, this is uh, uh, the general case. But the, the increase was less much less important in the case of regional outlets. So regional outlets, uh, regional online outlets uh, could increase their uh, advertising revenues with the increase in the use of internet, but less than uh, uh, national outlets or the rest of outlets. Uh, the use of internet also and, and uh, multi-homing, uh, so, sorry, so multi-homing between uh, print and online uh, outlets also increasing the, the, the spending of the, advertise, uh, the, sorry, the advertising revenues of the outlets and the multi-homing between uh, different online outlets also increased the advertising revenues of the, of the outlets. As you see, I have more results at that, but I'm not going to explain them. Finally, uh, we also, uh, before concluding, we also uh, analyze uh, the change in the advertising uh, spending of advertisers 
at the, uh, the advertiser year level. And then, so another question is, well, which was the reaction of uh, digitalization for advertisers? We, we have seen uh, the, the, the effects on the, uh, on the outlets, but which, how advertisers adjust to this situation? To, to this situation? What we see that is that in the case of the, um, uh, sorry. So what we see is that uh, advertisers reduce their spending in um, in uh, in print uh, outlets. That with the increase of multi-homing, there was this also reduced the, the spending of uh, the advertisers. So the the, in, the increase in the multi-homing in print and online uh, newspapers reduce the spending of uh, advertisers uh, in print newspapers. So when more uh, readers were using print and uh, online newspapers, then advertisers use less the print newspapers and, as we will see now, they started to use more the online newspapers. And finally, we find the, the effect uh, on the, we find the, the effects on uh, online uh, newspapers. So what we see is that the increase in the use of internet reduced, so this is something that we were not expecting, but the, the increase in the use of internet reduced the advertising uh, expenditures in online newspapers. But then the increase in multi-homing in online newspapers increased, increased the advertising expenditures in uh, online newspapers. So in general terms, what we see is that with the increase of internet use and with the increase of, increase of multi-homing, in general terms, what we observe is that uh, was a reduction in the, in the advertising revenues in uh, print newspapers, was a, an increase in the advertising revenues in um, online newspapers. It was a reduction in the uh, advertising spend, spending uh, of the advertisers in print newspapers, and it was an increase of the advertising expenditures of the advertisers in online uh, newspapers. But I think what is more important is to try to understand how these effects also affected uh, regional sports and the national uh, newspapers. So I, what I think, what we think that is important is also to understand uh, which were the heterogeneous effects of these um, of these changes. So it's important to understand well how uh, different types of newspapers were affected, has been affected by this digitalization, and also how. Uh, uh, advertisers have reacted in different ways, in the, uh, advertising in different newspapers according to their own characteristics. No? So this is the work that we have to do now. But I think what the general idea, that maybe the, the main takeaway of this uh, paper is to show that uh, the digitalization has had important implications because it has changed the, the, the behavior of uh, readers and this has important consequences uh, in the advertising uh, spendings of uh, advertisers that can, affect, that, that can affect the number and the, the, the quality of the products that offer uh, newspapers. All right, so these are the main uh, takeaways of this talk. Thank you, and now yes. have questions. Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Joan. If you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand. We have just uh, yeah, a couple of minutes. I think you've written about this, so I think you know it, but you asked about whether the increase in broadband was a function of the change in the readers, in which case you have an endogeneity problem. The literature generally says it's a deregulation of, on, of upper tiers of broadband by Spain in 2009 that kicked off the major investment that led to the increase in broadband coverage. And that policy was reversed starting in 2017, officially in 2021. And at that point, you see the investment numbers go down. But at that point, it's 70% built. So there's actually pretty good evidence to suggest that it, the increase in broadband coverage was not a function of changes in consumers. It was a, a function of changes in regulatory policy that changed, that allows you to rely on the exogeneity that you're really looking for. So this could be also used as a, an instrument. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in the case of Spain, uh, this, this was also an important change in the regulation yep. uh, that uh, implied that uh, investments in fiber started more or less in the year 2012. Yep. And the regulation was important because with the use of uh, the traditional broadband lines with uh, 
XDSL, um, Telefonica, which is the, the incumbent operator in Spain, was forced to use to, to, to give access to its network to the other firms. But fr uh, from this year, uh, Telefonica could start uh, investing in fiber without uh, giving access to its network to their competitors. So this is what uh, boosted the investment in fiber. But you said earlier, you need to, to make your model work, it has to be basically an exogenous change. And that explains why it's exogenous. It's not okay. actually a function of, of consumer. So what we have to, to explain is that the deployment of the road line across the Spanish provinces, because this is an analysis right. across the Spanish provinces, it's not related with changes in the in the in the um, in the preferences of uh, consumers regarding the use of online newspapers. And this, the regulatory explanation confirm, is, supports that that your assumption is valid. So the regulatory explanation uh, uh, shows that the, in, in one moment. Uh, Spanish Telefonica and the rest of the Spanish operators started to deploy to broadband, but uh, what is important to to explain is that this uh, response was not according to the demand factor. No? But, uh, but there, are, there are other reasons that explain that this uh, deployment was not uh, related with the demand factors. For example, uh, the deployment of uh, fever by Telefonica responded to other issues like uh, the unbundling of the local loop and uh, the, the presence of uh, competitors in the local exchanges of Telefonica. So Telefonica started to invest more in, in fever uh, in these uh, cities, sometimes uh, small cities, in which uh, it didn't face the competition of other, uh, of other firms. Or, for example, in which, or, um, so, sorry, so it started to, to invest more in places in which it has more competition in order to differentiate its offer. And in, in, for, for historical reasons, in some uh, municipalities, in some regions, Telefonica was facing the competition of cable operators and of other operators, and then uh, and Telefonica had to give access to its lines to these uh, competitors. And when uh, Telefonica started to invest in fever, it started to invest in fever in the places in which it had more competitors, which That's is not necessarily related with the, uh, the preferences of correct yeah. of users. Okay, perfect. So please join me in thanking Professor Joan Calzada. Thank, Thank you. you. Now you will know I have to announce the next word. The last word of this session is Bermuda. For those who are doing that, and we shall reconvene at 2.45. So we are uh, reconvening. Uh, the first word for the CLE for this session is viral. And uh, not to make uh, any suggestions about the nature of Kevin's talk, but here we are. Uh, without further ado, Kevin, take it away. OK, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, this is joint work with my friend Krishna Dasaratha. And so, um, you know, the motivation for this project really is the observation that sort of in the past decade or so, right, viral content um, social media platform, and by that I mean things like, you know, Facebook, Twitter, or Reddit, um, has really now become a prominent source of news for many people. Um, a key common feature of these platforms, we think, is that users are interacting with news feeds. What do I mean by that? Well, how these platforms usually work is that users are discovering and posting news stories onto the platform. These might be some articles that they read in a local newspaper. This might be a new scientific paper that they discovered. So the people are posting some kind of content. And there's usually a huge volume of this kind of new content being posted on a given day. And so there's no way anyone can read you know, all the content posted. So the platform has to be somehow selective and show you a selection of the content on the platform, right? So what the platform will do is that they're going to show each user a news feed that, that contains a small sample of the stories posted about them. Okay. You're going to you know, read these things in your news feed, and you have some way of expressing endorsement uh, for the thing that you just read. Yes? And this, this is a very platform-specific um, function, but this could be like, I don't, you know, retweeting something that you read on Twitter. This could be sharing a story you read on Facebook on your own you know, timeline. This could be you know, upvoting some content on Reddit. 
And the platform algorithm then determines how to use these endorsement actions from the previous users to determine what the future users will see in their news feeds. So for example, if I think about the uh, homepage of Twitter, right, the homepage of Twitter shows you a selection of tweets based in part on how many times these tweets have been liked and have been retweeted by others. And there's also this you know, special section on the side for the trending stories. So what is Twitter doing? You can think of what Twitter's doing as you know, using these endorsement actions by previous users, that is retweeting, liking, and so forth, right? using these endorsement actions to choose for you a new series of stories that you will see. Now, within such an environment where people are interacting with these news feeds that are selected on the basis of other people's you know, endorsement actions, right, a key design choice of the platform is the following. How much weight should the platform place upon virality, that is, the current popularity of content, that is, how many times it has been endorsed right, by previous users, in choosing which stories go into these news feeds. And so today I want to sort of uh, show you this uh, equilibrium model where users are interacting with news feeds. And we want to look at you know, trade-offs for learning when the platform is showing you more viral content as opposed to uh, more random content news feeds. That is, what are the pros and cons of showing users more of these viral slash popular content in the news feeds. Okay. And we think of this as sort of like a I guess important contemporary issue because number one, you know, this sort of dimension of you know vira uh, virality way is something that in practice, like you know, a lot of tech companies really think about it, it's really over. Look at the different iterations of like the Twitter homepage. Look at the different iterations of the Reddit ranking algorithm, right? So this, how much weight should be placed on these popular things as opposed to you know, really should should we put up as opposed to showing people you know more random content? That's something that people really uh, think about in practice. I guess another contemporary reason is, you know, in the recent years, there's been a lot of debate in the public sphere about whether this kinds of, you know, social platforms that, you know, social media platforms that like to push this viral content into people's news feeds, like to what extent did that really enable the spread of false information in different domains like, you know, public health and politics and so forth. So we think like the first step to understanding these questions would be to understand how does learning on these platforms differ when I look at different kinds of algorithms that differ in Know, how much emphasis they put on viral stuff. Okay, so, so just at a very high level, let me tell you the mechanism that we think is at play, like what are the pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of putting more emphasis on this kind of more viral content. Okay, so advantage. We think the advantage of uh, being more viral is that you're able to convey more information with just a few stories. What I mean by that? So this is something that you might have experienced yourself on Twitter. So on Twitter, if you read a few trending tweets, uh, that tends to give you a lot more information than reading just a few random tweets. Why does this happen? Well, a story in a viral news feed tends to carry more information than the realization of a single signal. Right? So if you see a positive story in your news feed, what does that mean? If the news feed was generated on the basis of how many times other people have endorsed these stories, then the mere fact of this story being in your news feed is informative. Right? Because it tells you something about others' endorsement action. The fact that this story, this tweet, is on the homepage it means lots of other people have endorsed this story. What does that then mean? Well, that lets you make some inferences about other people's information. Right? Maybe other people endorse this tweet on the basis of their private information, or maybe they saw some other story some, uh, which corroborated the content of the story. Okay, so in that sense, you're able to make some inferences about other people's information through seeing stuff in your newsfeed, and that's a mechanism through which you can develop like, stronger beliefs about the state. So two things. Um, how are you accounting for the endogeneity in what it means to be viral in the sense that I cannot upvote on something that I haven't seen. You can't upvote something you cannot see. That, that's right. So I, I cannot upvote something. You cannot, yeah, exactly. So, 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 you, so, so first you serve it to me, mm -hmm. and then I upvote it. Mm -hmm. But it could have been that thing would have been informative, but you didn't show it to me, right? That's right. So, so it may well be that. So we will later see that that one of the maybe disadvantages of being very uh, of doing this is that you know maybe 
you know, a lot of the stuff that goes viral are, are, are wrong. And so people look at those things, and in fact, that's the next point. So, you know, you're going to look at these popular things. You think that maybe this is the stuff that's, uh, that's correct. And in fact, if I don't serve you a piece of content, you can't even upload it. Right, so you tend to upload the stuff that we serve to you, so maybe this leads to a bad, bad cycle where we're trapped in learning about the wrong things. But, but yes, th this is certainly the, the cost, and so, so we'll look at, you know, in what context does that drive us to learn, to learn wrong? In, in, what, in what context will this be mitigated in, in the long run? Right. And then the second point is, this story that says if, a store, if an item has received many upvotes, right. I might consider it to be more informative. Isn't there an implicit assumption that somehow these upvotes are independent of each other? It's in other words, that, that's okay, not good, 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 good. So, so yeah, so you're right. Whether or not something having having very high popularity, whether that's informative or not, of course, depends on somehow you know how people are doing this kind of upvoting. And so, the meaning of being popular is in double equilibrium. So, indeed, we will see that. Uh, well, in the in the model, the upvotes won't be independent of each other because it depends on you know why you upvote really depends on what what else things you have seen and so presumably the upvotes would be, be dependent on each other. In fact, the distribution of votes on different stories will follow some kind of a you know parallel distribution, right? Things that have a lot of votes get served a lot, and so you know they get even more votes. So so they they're not independent, but uh, even in such a context where the votes are correlated, they still contain some information. And we will see that uh, this basic logic will tell you that somehow, you know, in, in some domain, you know, being more viral does actually give you more information. But, but you, you're very much right. They're not independent. And in equilibrium, we have to account for that. Uh, users are going to be accounting for that when, when they look at the stories. Um, but just as um, Rakesh said, you know, there's very much a disadvantage of, of having these viral news feeds. And, and the idea is, you know, we can end up in these misleading steady states where wrong stories dominate even if users are rational. So these, we're going to be looking at a model of like very smart users who are you know, doing, you know, applying all the very rational thinking and doing the best they can. Nevertheless, you know, these very rational users uh, can go wrong in the following sense. We can get into a situation where okay, most of the content, just majority of the content on the platform are actually correct. Okay? But we still serve users incorrect stories more often after we weigh by popularity. That makes sense. So that if I just count in terms of numerical majority of the stories, a majority of those are correct. But because I'm weighing by, by popularity, it may, be, it may well be that this minority of incorrect stories happen to be more popular and thus get served more. And this leads into this kind of cycle, right? So we can have this kind of misleading steady state that self-perpetuates. People could see these incorrect stories. They end up developing incorrect beliefs. They think that this incorrect state is true. And based on that belief, they give even more votes to these incorrect stories, which makes them more popular and does serve more. And so, okay. and so essentially what we're going to be looking at in the rest of the talk is like a formal model to formalize this intuition and to ask, you know, how do we deal with this kind of trade-off? So let me tell you a bit about uh, how this model works. So uh, in, this, in this model, we imagine that there is an unknown state of nature, omega, which is either negative or positive. Let's say both of these two cases are equally likely. We're going to think about a finite group of n agents who are placed into positions once through n and they're going to move in order. Uh, I'm going to say that these agents don't know their position and their whole uniform prior. So they're n people, and I put them at random into these n positions. Okay, and each person is equally likely to be in each of these n positions. Now, these agents are going to get IID binary symmetric private signals about the state. So the state is negative or positive, and each person has a binary signal, negative or positive. Okay. And I'm going to think of these signals as news story. So each person, each person's SI refers to like a news story that they read in like a, an offline uh, uh, newspaper, for example. Okay. And there is some Q chance that each story matches the state. So Q, a number between half and one, is the precision of the story. So it may be that whenever you know, the state is positive, I don't know, there's 80% chance that each of these stories matches. E each of the stories will be positive. 20% of the stories will be wrong, they will be negative. 
So the first thing that happens when Agent I arrives is that Agent I posts their story, SI, onto the platform. It gets added to the database of the platform. Okay, so I'm going to be keeping track of, for each story, an integer, which is called its popularity score. A story that has just been posted starts at a popularity score of one point. And then we have this news feed. Okay, in addition to this private signal, something you read in a local newspaper, you're also going to see a news feed of capital K stories, which are the stories posted by others. It's drawn from this database of all the stories that you know all the people before you have posted. And the sampling of which capital K stories to show you, that will be done somehow based on the current popularity score of the stories. Okay, now I'll be more precise as to how this sampling happens. But um, to simplify, so one simplifying assumption is that I'm going to say that you will not see the precise popularity score of the stuff in the newsfeed. So you will know that stuff in your newsfeed is more likely to be popular than the average ones, uh, but you, know, it, you don't see the exact number of times that, that they have been uploaded. Um, now there's also another slight issue, which is if I'm to serve capital K stories to each agent to see, um, if I'm looking at the first capital K agents who are to move, uh, I don't yet have capital K stories, but each person is bringing with them a story onto the platform. So this whole business of seeing a news feed, this will only start with, cap with agent capital K plus one. For the, first, for the agents in the first capital K position, they will simply uh, see their privacy in SI. And then uh, if you are someone who is at least person ca ca capital K plus one, you're going to share some of the stories, C stories, all of the capital K stories from your newsfeed, and each shared story would increase its popularity score by one point. Okay, so the popularity score is keeping track of how many times it's been shared by other people. Okay. And what's your incentive for sharing? I'm going to be looking at a model where uh, you're going to get some positivity uh, for each shared story that matches the state. So you want to share stories which, according to your belief, are more likely to match the state. Um, are agents sharing stories in a sort of a batch, or is it like a sequential choice of like they see story one okay. and then share? Yeah, that's or a, choose not to share. Okay, great question. They're going to see all of the K stories all at once, and then they share all C stories all at once. That's it. So, so they're not sequentially seeing stories and then sharing. Um, so they're going to see all of them and deciding which case, which C to share. So, so, so let, 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 me, let me give you, I guess, one example of, of like, you know, an illustration of this for, you know, let, let's, say, let's say I'm in a world where people see three stories, share one, okay? Uh, imagine uh, five people have already acted, and so you can see here that, you know, on, on the first row there, I'm displaying for you the five uh, new stories which are inside the database of the platform, okay? So, you know, I'm coloring in green the two stories which have a positive realization, and coloring in red the three stories that have a negative realization. I'm also keeping track of the popularity score of each story, okay? But this database is not what people see, what the users see when they go onto the platform, right? So imagine user number six comes onto the platform. The first thing that will happen is that person six has a private signal, right? So person six reads some news, uh, newspaper and gets a news story, S6. Let's say this X, S6 happens to be positive. In addition to that, we're going to sample three stories from the database of all existing stories to put into the news feed of this person six. Okay, let's say the sampling happens to hit story three, story one, and story four. So what does the world look like from person six perspective? Person six says, I have a positive private signal, and I've seen a news feed containing two positive stories and one negative story. On the basis of that information, person six must make a decision which of these three stories you share. So remember, this is a world where A is three, C is one, so that means you see three stories, you share one. Okay. You're going to share one story out of this set of three news feed stories you have. And your incentive for sharing is that if you happen to share a story that matches the state, you get some positive too. So let's say you, know, you choose to share this one in the middle. And what that will do is, because you share story number one, right? so you can see this here, uh, the score, the popularity score of this first story goes up at one point. That's the consequence of you know, being shared. What will happen now is that person six would have you know, posted their private signal S6 onto the platform, so that starts as you know, a story with a score of one. 
And remember, this um, the first story store. The, uh, the first story, its popularity score has been increased to three because of the sharing action of the uh, person six. And now person seven comes onto the platform. Person seven again has their private signal. Let's say they happen to read a negative story in their newspaper, and then we're going to again sample for them three stories from the database. But now our sampling probabilities may have changed, partly because we now have a new thing that we can sample. Uh, you know, the sixth story, partly because, okay, the score of the first story has now increased, so maybe that's increased the probability with which it ends up into sample. Okay, so I sample three stories for this person, maybe I hit story six, story four, and story one. And once again, this person has to make a decision of which of these three stories to ship, and so forth. That, that's the basic idea of how this model works. Um, tr just trying to understand, what is the role, you know, you have, you have this inequality in the last slide, you know, C being less than K over two. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what is the role that... that What's is? the role? So later we will see that an important strategy analyzing this, um, analyzing this model is the so-called majority rule, uh, which is to say, uh, which is to say I want to share things, uh, stories which are in the, which are in the majority, in the, major, in, 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 like, the story that I have more of in the newsfeed. Okay. So that's a simplifying... We think of it, well, we think, this, we think the same results are probably true. Analysis is certainly a lot simpler uh -huh. in, in this case. So if you can share more than half of what you read, you may end up sharing things which are not. So, so let, let, let's, let's see, let, let's say you read four positive stories and three negative ones. And you're like, I'm going to share six things. You can end up sharing some of the things that disagree, in fact, with your, with, with, with your oh. posterior belief. So it certainly makes things easier that you're sharing things. Um, we, 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 in some sense, we think of this as probably being realistic because I think most people don't share more than half of <laughs> more than half of what they read. Um, in these, in these. So I'm curious about the flip side of this, and perhaps you'll get to yeah, uh, the, uh, this. Uh, I imagine if we have uh, some users who are C equals zero, I only read, okay. I don't reshare. That's not going to affect the model at all. That but, won't matter. Yeah, that won't matter. But what about the super sharers, the uh -huh. people? Uh, who they don't read much at all. They hop on Twitter and they just post and post and post and post. Okay. So they, they might be K equals zero. Oh, you, oh, you, you're imagining K. people who are simply, let, let's say, sharing everything, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. Sharing everything. Let me try to think about this for a second. Um, I think that's going to be okay. Um, I, I, I think the basic method, so, so basically the super shares, what they tend to do is they basically amplify whatever state you're in, in some sense, right? So if you're in a state where most of the things are wrong, by this amplification, they, you know, they, they, keep, they, they, they keep pushing them more in that direction. So I think the basic force is going to be similar, but the precise cutoff as to where we get you know, things turning bad might be wrong, might, might be different. Okay. Did you already tell us how that newsfeed is generated? I have not, yet. I have not yet told you how the yeah. newsfeed it, it, the, how the news feed is generated is on this slide. Okay. So uh, yeah, exactly that, that that's a part model I have not yet covered. So how do we generate the newsfeed? Okay. The key parameter hold, hold, which is hold, hold on, Kevin. Yeah. Just to, I, I guess I was thinking of a response to Gus's question, which would be um, you have users that are sincere. Mm -hmm and you're limiting what they can share, and therefore they share what they think is closest to the truth. Okay. So if something bad happens, this is interesting, mm -hmm. right? If, if users were evil or stupid and something bad happens, that, that's not interesting. Just change the users, right? <laughs> right. So in, in, in some ways, we think of our model as a, um, a world that's rigged in favor of good social learning outcomes, if anything, right? So there are lots of things we can add here that makes it easier for things to go wrong. But I guess we're saying even in this world, things could go wrong. Like, like you, you hear these two users have a pretty nice objective. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to share things that are correct, but you know, we can have like some evil user that have to have some other user. In fact, later on, we'll look at an application of this where we ask, what if we have a fraction of people who are like malicious mm -hmm. and their only goal is to share things which are wrong? So like what fraction of these malicious users can we tolerate on the platform? And we'll also see that this is a function of how viral your platform is. I, I, I look forward to seeing the evil or, or, Yeah, exactly. The, the, the bots is the other. We didn't want to pre put a precise um, interpretation as to what these 
people are. We, we say there's some ways, some users are exogenously always just sharing wrong things. Indeed, they may indeed be these bots who are, have the goal of sabotaging the platform. So, yeah. How do you assess what is true or like? Oh, how do we assess what is true? Um, so, okay. So in in this in, in within the context of this model, so there is some true state of the world, and stories are either true or false, with, depending on whether they reflect that state of the world. Now, in practice, how do you assess whether something is true? We're not asking we're not asking the platform to do the assessment. So the the platform in sampling things or something like that, they're never using whether a story is true or not to decide whether to show it in your newsfeed. Does that make sense? So, so we'll see this in a little bit. So, but, but if the question is how does the platform assess whether a story is accurate or not, we're not asking the platform to perform any kind of fact checks. We're, we're simply um, using the popularity score to de de determine whether something should be said. Now, if you were to add in something like fact check or something like that, that, that would, I think, be maybe another check against um, but, but this is the simplest model where there is no fact checking, there is no platform trying to do anything very sophisticated beyond simply deciding what to sample on the basis of only the popularity score. Again, the platforms are doing the platforms in practice are doing lots of other things, but we want to focus on just this one dimension of the platform design. That is how viral, how much by how, how much I use the popularity score for, for now. Okay. How are, using, how are we using this key parameter? So the key parameter here is this thing that we call the virality weight. It's a number lambda in zero one that determines how we sample these capital case stories to generate the news. Okay, look, we've got capital case slots we have to fill in the news. For each of these slots, with probability lambda, I'm going to sample a story with probabilities proportional to popular score. With the complementary probability, I'm going to sample a story uniformly at random from the set of all stories. So lambda equals to 1, it means I'm just always sampling proportionally to popularity score. Lambda equals 0, I ignore the popularity score, and I just do a simple uniform random sample. Okay. Lambda somewhere in, in the middle, well, you know, higher lambda basically is sort of more, uh, putting more emphasis on the, on the virality, on the popularity score. Basically. Intermediate levels lambda interpolate between these two pieces. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the context. What's the equilibrium? What, what's the behavior? Well, right. So remember, each person is choosing which capital capital C stories to share, right? Based on the realization of the private signal SI and based on the realization of the new C stories. Okay, and we're going to be looking at. Player symmetric and state symmetric Bayesian Nash equilibrium. What do I mean by this? Player symmetric, I mean all n people are using the same strategy. State symmetric, I mean that common strategy they use treats positive and negative stories in a symmetric way. So again, let me emphasize that because we're looking at equilibrium, what does this mean? Players are interpreting the content of their newsfeed in a rational way, in a Bayesian way. So that is, given how the sampling is done and given how others behave, right? There is some, there's some like, there's some equilibrium meaning of, of seeing three positive stories and two negative stories in your newsfeed, right? You can calculate the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the probability of having this event happen when the state is good and when the state is bad, right? So and then you can use Bayes' rule, right, to compute the posterior belief about the state, and you're forming this kind of rational Bayesian beliefs based on what you see in the newsfeeds. And remember, people have this utility of wanting to share things that are correct. So basically what's happening is people are in an equilibrium where they're correctly interpreting their news feeds, they correctly understand how the news feeds are generated, and they're trying to share things which according to that, like posterior belief, are more likely to be true. Okay. So mostly we're interested in these equilibria when n grows large, so a platform with a large number of users. And so basically the following definition is saying we want to look at you know, the limit of equilibria. So we're going to be fixing the other parameters. We're going to fix uh, the precision of the stories, Q. We're going to fix the size of the news feed, K. We're going to fix how many things people share, that's C. And we're going to fix this uh, virality weight parameter. Okay. I'm going to say a strategy sigma star. So 
the strategy here is how how you're doing this kind of sharing, right? On the basis of what you see in your newsfeed and what you see as your private signal. Okay, a strategy is a limit equilibrium if it's the limit of a sequence of Bayesian natural equilibria for societies with you know larger and larger number of people as the number of people tend to infinity. So I take a sequence of equilibria for society, large and larger societies, and that thing converges to something, right? That limit of the equilibrium, I call that a limit equilibrium. So the key question we want to ask in this, in this work is really what kind of content right, gets shown in people's newsfeed in the limit equilibria as a function of lambda? You know, as I make this uh, newsfeed more or less viral, how does that change the kinds of things that, things that people tend to see? And in order to answer that question in a more precise way, we want to define a key statistic that captures the evolution of content on the platform. And the long run, uh, and we'll look at the long run behavior of that statistic under limit equilibrium strategies. And the statistic we want to look at is this thing called viral accuracy, which is simply, um, if I look at all the popularity score on the platform, what fraction of that popularity score is assigned to the state matching stories, the correct stories. Okay, so, right, if we go back to this example before, right, after uh, person six uh, has acted, um, you know, let's imagine that the true state is positive. Okay, so how many points of score, popularity score, do I have on the correct story? So that's that's three plus the two plus the one, right? So I have six points. What about uh, how many points of score do I have on the incorrect stories, on the negative stories? That's 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals to 3. So in this case, you will say viral accuracy at this point is equal to 2 thirds, right? 2 thirds of the total score on the platform are on the actually correct stories. So think of, a, think of viral accuracy as a popularity weighted measure of how accurate is the content on your platform. Now, imagine I have an infinite society. Imagine every person uses the same fixed strategy sigma. What you will end up having is a stochastic process of viral accuracy. Right? There's some randomness because there's randomness in the realization of people's private signals. There's some randomness in you know, what people get to sample and get to see and so forth. Right? So, so there's some, you know, there's a stochastic process of what the viral accuracy is by the point that person T has acted. Okay? Uh, a preliminary result that I won't really say much about is a convergence result, which is Fixing any strategy, almost surely you have this convergence of viral accuracy. So viral accuracy, this number of like what fraction of score is on the correct story, it doesn't sort of cycle forever. Eventually, it converges to some point. Okay, and it turns out if you want to ask like what are the limit points like in the long run, what does viral accuracy settle down to be? You can answer that question by looking at the stable fixed points of a function called the inflow accuracy function. Let me tell you what, what, uh, what, what I mean by that. So, uh, so let's, let, let, let's look at an example where I'm fixing a particular environment and I'm facing <coughs> a particular sharing strategy within that environment. Okay, so the environment I'm fixing is, okay, uh, people are seeing seven things and they're going to share three. Okay, K equals to seven, C equals to C. Uh, Q is 55%. So each story has 55% chance of being correct. And lambda is equal to one. I'm just sampling proportional to popular score. We're going to think about a strategy which will become important later on, which is called majority rule. So what does majority rule mean here? I'm seeing seven stories to my new feed. So there must be a majority side. I'm going to see four more of you know, the majority side of stories. Okay. Whichever kind of story is in, the, is in the majority, I'm going to share three of them. That's a, that's a majority rule. Okay, I, I basically, basically in, in fact, I will, in particular, this implies I will ignore the private signal. I will ignore my private signal. I look at the seven things in my newsfeed, and I share three things from the majority side of the newsfeed. Okay. What this picture is showing you is, well, suppose people are using this, uh, this, this majority rule to share things. Okay. On the, x-axis, I have the current viral accuracy. What fraction of popularity score is associated with the correct stories uh, on the platform? Okay. On the y-axis, it's the fraction of incoming score which will be allocated to the correct stories. When a new person arrives on the platform, they're going to bring with them C plus 1 extra points. Why? They post a story onto the platform, 
that story comes with like one, one point of popularity when posted. They're also going to share C things, right? And each shared story increases its popularity score by one point. So overall, each person contributes C plus one points to the popularity score of the platform. So what I'm plotting on the y-axis is like what fraction of those C plus one new points are expected to be allocated to the correct stories as a function of like what total number of points on the platform are currently being allocated to the correct stories. Right? So that's what this black curve is showing you. Right? And the dotted line is the 45 degree line. Okay? Ignore the intersection with the 45 degree line in the middle, that's not stable. But if I look at the two other intersections, those are fixed points, right? Fixed points of the function. So for example, on the right hand side, uh, we can, I guess that's roughly at 90%. So that's roughly saying like, you know, if currently 90% of the popularity score are on the correct stories, then 90% of incoming score are going to be expected to be on the correct story. So somehow intuitively speaking, that should be like, you know, a long run, you know, sort of um, steady state of this kind of system. And if you look at this picture, what this is telling you is, in fact, we have two steady states. We have an informative steady state, where most of the, st most of the newsfeed stories are correct. But we also have another fixed point to the left of a half, right? We have a second fixed point to the left, and that's a misleading steady state. That's a case where uh, we're, we've come to rest at a point where viral accuracy is far less than half, where most of the newsfeed stories are, in fact, wrong. And what we can show, in fact, is we can indeed do this kind of like uh, fixed point analysis to figure out what would be the long run uh, uh, steady state. So that is uh, viral accuracy, the stochastic process of viral accuracy would converge to every fixed point of this kind of info accuracy function with positive probability, provided it's not something that's like unstable from both sides, like the one in the middle. Okay, so the key. Can you just kind of, so can you jump over them? What's that? Can you jump over them? What What do you mean by can you jump over? So, them? so you don't you don't have the initial condition in that state. Oh yeah, right? yeah, I see, I see. So so you you have some initial condition, and I think even if your initial condition is to the to the very much to the right, let's say you can still jump over to the left. You will come to rest on one of them, but you could initially fluctuate a little bit, but eventually okay, you'll come. Okay. To, but but yes, you, you can jump over it. Yeah, you can jump over it. Because I guess it's because it's a, it's really a discrete time process. So so you could, yeah. Um, so so I guess okay. One example is you could always imagine a situation of you know you start having I don't know, three wrong things and a hundred correct things, but you, there's of course the really low probability event of keep serving people those three wrong things and they keep having wrong signals, and so there's some small probability that. We jump over to the other, uh, other one. We keep drifting downwards in some sense, right? Does that, does that, is that? Yeah. No, I, was, I mean, yeah. maybe I'll ask later yeah, about, yeah. about the connections to the herding literature, but. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We, 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 we can look at it. Uh, so, 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 in some sense, um, okay. So, the, 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 the main, the main uh, question we were after, I guess, is sort of what does. Um, what does steady state look like in equilibrium, right? As a function of lambda, as a function of how um, how much weight you put on this kind of virality. And the answer is basically under equilibrium behavior, when people are in equilibrium, in this limited equilibrium with large number of agents, uh, we have a discontinuous emergence of these misleading steady states at a certain threshold value. I'll tell you later on maybe about what this threshold value is or how you calculate it, but. For now, you know, there's some number between zero and one that's a threshold I'll call lambda star. Okay. The result is, okay, if your lambda is at or below lambda star, there is only one limit equilibrium, and that limit equilibrium is the majority rule. Okay. If you are strictly below the threshold, uh, this unique equilibrium induces only one steady state, and that steady state is informative. That is, uh, more likely than not, uh, uh, you're seeing correct stories. You know. On the other hand, if you are above that threshold, then every equilibrium must induce at least one misleading steady state. So that there's always a positive probability chance in every limit equilibrium 
that we end up converging to the situation where most of the content being shown to users is wrong. Okay, so we have a, a sharp discontinuity around uh, lambda star. Right, so it, it, so um, and, and earlier on, I told you about the pros and cons right, of having a more viral news feed. And we're beginning to formalize that in terms of formal results. Right? So this is formalizing this message of the disadvantage of being more viral. Right? Early on, I told you, okay, the disadvantage of being too viral is that, well, um, um, we can generate these misleading steady states where people keep seeing wrong things and keep upvoting wrong things. And this is saying precisely when does that happen. If your virality weight is above this threshold, which I still haven't told you what it is yet, but if your virality weight is above this lambda star threshold, then in every equilibrium, right, it must be the case that you have these bad steady states. I have a question. How to think about these misleading steady states? Yeah. Because if everyone is Bayesian, can uh, can it be that you know they just flip it in the meaning, and as they right. have, so, so, so in some sense these misleading steady states can be as informative as. But, 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 here, but here's the thing, so, so everyone is Bayesian, indeed everyone is Bayesian, but in the lambda above lambda star uh, regime, right. what's happening is sometimes you end up in a good steady state and sometimes a bad steady state. You don't know which one you end up in. Right, that so does that it's make sense? So, not so, just being in a misleading state, but the fact that you do not know. The, exactly, exactly. So, 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 so it, learning on the platform sometimes brings you to a good steady state, sometimes a bad one. Overall, I guess it must bring you to a good one with sufficient probability such that Bayesian agents find it optimal to trust their signal or something. Well, so it's a little bit tricky. I, I guess when you're above lambda star, they're not always usually, like majority rule stops being an equilibrium, so it's not quite majority rule that they're, that they're using. But yes, they're, they're, they are, they're doing something else. They're, they're, they're cleverly accounting for the fact that they may be in a wrong steady state. But, but even so, they're still in a situation where their upvoting is such that they get, they get stuck there. <laughs> does, that, does that mean part three is a probabilistic statement? Uh, well, when I, so, uh, so, wait, well, what, so steady state is something which we converge to with positive probability. When we say this thing admits a steady, when we say a strategy admits a misleading steady state, we mean with positive probability it leads people to. So, so, so steady states are things that we converge with probability greater than zero. Yeah, but yes, that's a, prob that, that's a probabilistic statement. Um, okay, so, so that's the disadvantage, right? right? So why is it bad to have, mis to, to have these sort of um, viral platforms? But what's the advantage, right? So wh why might we want to have um, a more viral news feeds? Well, um, it turns out that if you're in this regime where there's only one steady state and it's guaranteed to be the good steady state, it turns out that increasing uh, virality weight is a good thing. Okay? When you're below the threshold where bad steady states start to appear, it turns out that viral accuracy as well as sampling accuracy, which is the probability of getting correct stories in your news feeds, they're both going to monotonically increase in that. And this then formalizes the message that of, of this advantage right, of, of being more viral. In some sense, if you weigh virality more heavily, well, you're going to help aggregate more information. In the long run, you end up in a situation where the stuff that you see in your news feeds become more accurate indicators of the true state. And I guess that's the overall trade-off for increasing lambda. What happens when you increase the lambda, when you increase how much emphasis I put on viral content in news feeds, right? The trade-off is the following. I'm going to aggregate more information, but I can create this kind of systemic risk, a situation where most people in society are holding incorrect beliefs. Okay, so I guess, um, let me say a little bit about what this um, threshold is, right? How do I calculate this threshold and um, where this kind of change happened, where we first start getting this bad steady state, right? So, so um, it turns out this lambda star is defined in the following way. Look at majority rule. Okay? Majority rule will have different, will behave differently under different lambdas. Look for the smallest value of lambda such that majority rule generates a bad steady state. Okay? That, that, that's what this thing is saying. So the smallest value of lambda such that the majority rule has a fixed point, so such that, well, more, more precisely, the inflow accuracy function of the majority rule has a fixed point at a point less than half. Okay. That is going to be your critical 
that's going to be your critical um, threshold. That's a critical virality way where this kind of change happens. Okay, so what we're so what we're doing here is we're defining this threshold, the critical virality way, in terms of a particular strategy, the majority rule. But of course, majority rule need not itself be an equilibrium. And so it's a it's a funny part of a uh, funny property of analysis that we can focus on a particular strategy to make statements about all equilibria. Okay, it turns out later on, like, you know, for, for high enough value of lambda, majority rule is not itself an equilibrium, but we only need to analyze majority rule in order to understand all equilibria. And why is this true? It's because of certain properties of majority rule. That, okay, there are two properties of majority rule. Property number one is if there are no bad steady states, then majority rule is the best response. If you know you live in a society where you only have a good, a good steady state, you should use majority rule. Property number two is majority rule is also, is also the strategy which is most likely to amplify bad steady states. Does that make sense? So if things are going wrong, what's the best way for things to go wrong even more? Um, it's actually to use majority rule. Because of both of these two properties, you can show that if there's a bad steady state under any strategy, there must also be one under majority rule. And furthermore, if there's no bad steady state, then you should, you should use uh, the majority rule. These two things allow you to, to only analyze majority rule in order to understand all equilibrium. So, so, so let me give you an example of how to calculate this lambda star. So what I mean is the following. So again, in a situation of seeing seven things and sharing three things and Q equals zero is 55%, right? I can imagine, so early on I showed you what the inflow accuracy function looks like when lambda is, is equal to one, right? You can imagine plotting the same picture for different values of lambda, right? It can be like lambda equals to 0 0.3, lambda equals 0 0.6, lambda equals 0 0.9, and these are the three pictures I show here. What you can see is, I don't know if it shows up well, okay. What you can see is in the first two pictures, I only have one intersection, right, with the 45 degree line, and that intersection is above a half. In the third one, I've got, you know, this extra intersection to the left, which is below a half. If you mentally interpolate the second picture and the third picture, you'll realize that for some lambda value between 0 0.6 and 0 0.9, there must be some lowest value of lambda where I first get that extra intersection, right? That's below a half. And that's, and that's lambda star. That, that value of lambda, the smallest value of lambda, turns out to be 0 0.76, okay? 0 0.76 where you have this extra intersection below a half. In fact, it has to look like this, right? It has to look like a point of tangents when it first happens. Um, okay, so, so, you know, basically in this paper, uh, stuff, <coughs> hinges on the value of lambda star. Like things are different depending on whether your virality is above or below this, um, this value of, 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 of lambda star. And so we have some um, comparative statics of lambda star. Because if your lambda star, if in an environment your lambda star is larger, that means during an environment where you're less susceptible to misleading steady state, right? I, I'm, I can choose a larger range of lambda before running into bad steady states. So, so just to understand yeah. the lambda star, like, yes or no question, if it takes more, don't answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is lambda star the point at which learning stops at some finite time under the majority rule or not? Is it something which learning stops under finite time? I would say learning never stops under finite time. But then how can you have the misleading steady state if learning never stops? So. Oh, how can I have a misleading it's like, is, is, it, is it the same as in these herding no, models that basically for higher no. lambdas at some point the okay, 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 yeah, yeah, overwhelms so what I have as my private signal yeah, and hence so, we can have it as bad steady state? Is that like the critical threshold for yeah, that? So, so, so I think we should have a, maybe a conversation about the herding literature here. So like um, in this model, learning never stops. That, that's maybe one distinction. So in every period, remember, new stuff is coming in, right? And I'm seeing things unfolding and so in every period belief is keeps on moving right so does that make sense so so learning never really stops but there is a kind of positive feedback cycle i mean maybe that's a sense in which it may be similar so even though learning never stops how can we get trapped in a bad steady state? uh so i don't know if you look at this third picture here how can i get trapped into this steady state to the left well how this could happen is you know currently only 20% of the score are on the correct stories. So, so a, a person comes in and they tend to see these, uh, well, 
some people will be seeing positive stories and then they'll be contributing to the positive side. But a majority of people are seeing negative things and contributing to the negative side. So, so, so learning never stops, but I guess more likely than not, people are contributing towards the negative side. Right? So, so, learning, so this belief, it converges to that point, but it never in finite time stops. So, so, so the mechanism here is not so much, oh, we're in an information cascade and all information has somehow stopped. All information flow has somehow stopped. Rather, here it's, um, I guess, it's sort of, we are, we, are, we are trapped within the locality and we're sort of wiggling a little bit around here but never escaping this. But, but here each person at, uh, observes at most k. A person story, observes right? at so, most k things. So in some sense, each learning is fine for each person, but it, because people arrive, it just, there is dynamic process, right? Let's say that again. So the, the learning is fine for each person. So I, I observe this k, I learn. So I, I will never learn the truth in some sense. Yeah, yeah. So that that that, 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 that that's true in general for, for, for these people. They are they are um they're yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, it's, they also don't know where There's they a are. Difference in some yeah. sense. They, they also don't know where they are. That's the other thing. They they don't know yeah. which, which position they are. But but yes, uh, once we're stuck here, for example, uh, I mean that's going to be the accuracy. We we're, we're we're basically bounded away from from one. Yeah, bounded away from one. In the picture that's on the furthest right, are those two misleading steady states? That this is okay. Good. This is a misleading steady state. This is a good informative steady state. That's not a steady state because it's unstable. So, so basically the way you can see it's unstable is, imagine I'm here, if I'm a little bit to the right, you see the black line is now above the dotted line. Therefore, if I'm a little bit to the right, I should run away to the other steady state. If I'm a little bit to the left, the black line is now below the blue line. Therefore, I should move to the left and to this thing. So, so if you draw the arrows of like where you tend to move around this thing, you will see that uh, around here, you run away to either the steady state or this one, but both of this one and this one are in fact um, stable. You, you do actually <coughs> end up trapped there with part of the probability. Uh, another thing that we, I haven't mentioned, which is it's actually, you also get trapped here with part of the probability. Even if it's, uh, it's tangent, you also get trapped there with part of the probability, but that, 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 that's a technical thing that comes out of this. But anyway, um, okay, so comparative, comparative statics on, on, on lambda star. Um, so, you know, in what environments do I have a bigger lambda star? Having a bigger lambda star means, um, having a bigger lambda star means it's sort of, I'm somehow more susceptible to, uh, so sorry, less susceptible to misleading status. I'm more robust to misleading status, right? Because I can choose, I have a bigger range in choosing my lambda before hitting this bad situation where I have bad, uh, bad status. Okay, so, so, uh, so lambda star is going to increase when story precision increases, it's going to decrease when the number of sh uh, shared signals increases, and also decreases when we make the newsfeed size big, okay, by two. But why there's a weird parity issue, but don't, don't worry too much about this. So, so basically, the, the, the message is, when do we tend to get misleading steady states? We tend to get misleading steady states in those situations where people interact with too much social information relative to the quality of their offline private information. When do things tend to go wrong? People spend a lot of time on these social media platforms, uh, you know, reading and you know, retweeting uh, relative to the stuff that they, the information they get from other independent sources which are disconnected from such platforms. Okay, these are the situations where we will be more worried about these things that is happening. Um, Okay, um, so I have on TOS, is it 345? Okay, good. Um, and there's yeah. a question online. Yeah, and there's a question online. Um, do I? I'll finish your presentation. Then. Finish my presentation, yeah, no, no, okay. Uh, okay, um, maybe I'll, okay, I'll, I'll say a few words about the, a few words about design and then, okay, so, okay, good. So we can essentially use the characterization of equilibrium steady states to ask questions about design. So, right, so, so for now, we, we, we just say, okay, we have exogenously fixed some value of lambda. Okay, so, so, so that's how viral the news feed is. Now, what if the platform were being designed by someone with an objective function, and they're trying to tune that value of lambda in order to maximize that objective function? Okay. So, suppose, so, so this result takes a fairly general class of objective functions, uh, we just need this objective function to be, so we're maximizing some sort of function 
of the final viral accuracy. So take the final accuracy, viral accuracy of the uh, of like of the nth person, and I'm going to apply a function to it, and that's the utility of the design. Okay. Um, for example, what you could do is you can imagine I'm simply maximizing the final viral accuracy after the last person has acted. It turns out that that's equivalent to maximizing user utility from sharing. So that's that would be the uh, uh, the benevolent social planner's objective. Um, the following result would work whenever you have any objective function which is increasing on um, half to one. Okay. And the result says if I think about what's the what's the uh, you know objective maximizing uh, virality weight for n users, and I think about how the sequence behaves as n becomes large, the limb inf of this uh, sequence is at least lambda star. It's at least this critical virality weight. So what does that mean? Uh, there are two possibilities when there are a lot of users. Number one, maybe the optimal is strictly above lambda star. That means in the optimal design, the platform chooses to accept the possibility of these bad steady states. I guess in exchange for having you know, stronger beliefs in when, when we do hit the good steady states. The second possibility is I'm approaching lambda star from below, right? It could be that lambda ends are just approaching lambda star from below but never exceeding it. In that case, what we're doing is we're engaging in a form of brinkmanship. We're choosing lambda just below the threshold, which would cause a discontinuous drop in user utility. So if I'm slightly misspecified in my parameters, I'm slightly wrong about what Q is, for example, then you know, I would actually be into this region where I have bad steady states. And okay, um, it turns out we can also say a few words about uh, yeah. We can, we can also uh, we can also we can also bound how many of these bots or bad users we can we, we can have we can tolerate on the platform without running into bad steady state. So if I am in a region that's below lambda star, we can ask what's the maximum fraction of these bots that we can have without uh, generating any bad steady states. But let me maybe skip that in the interest of time, and let me con let me look at the conclusion and answer this question that's, that's on Zoom. So, so you know, this is an equilibrium model of social media platform where people are exogenously discovering stories and posting them onto the platform. They're also reading a small selection of the past stories in a newsfeed, and they're going to form beliefs and share some of the stories that they've read, and they're trying to maximize the number of accurate stories shared. Right. So what we're looking at here is how the sampling rule, which populates these news feeds, affects long-run learning equilibrium. And the key results to remember are like, if your virality weight is very low, increasing that weight is really very good. With, uh, it's a very good idea. It has no downside. It makes for a more informative equilibrium steady state, and there's really no drawback to doing that. But if virality weight is high enough, then we start to generate these misleading equilibrium steady states. And these misleading steady states sort of discontinuously appear at the threshold of lambda star. One technical contribution of the paper, which I think I haven't really emphasized too much about, is it turns out analysis applies stochastic approximation rules in an equilibrium setting. What, what I mean by this is, you know, in different contexts in economics, we often apply stochastic approximation to a particular mechanical and exogenously fixed behavior rule. We often do this in learning games or in, in some other parts of social learning. But here, we're applying stochastic approximation in, in equilibrium setting. That is, we're not taking an arbitrary behavior. We're asking behavior to also be optimal given you know, the steady states generated by that behavior. Right? So, so, so that, that's a sense in which we think of this as like, like, like a technical contribution. Um, let me, is there a way to see what the question is? Um, I just have some results. Yeah, okay. So the question is, sorry. Can a private entity censor before reaching la the Lambda threshold to bolster platform liability? Is there a numerical value assigned or case by case? Can a private entity censor censor? Uh, like, like censor the content, I think, before we reach the threshold. I see, I see, I see. Um, interesting. So I think if a private ent let, let, let's say the platform could detect, you know, which uh, which side is actually true, like if the state is actually positive or negative, 
you could then imagine <coughs> maybe a broader range of intervention that, that, that I can try to do, right, to try to uh, prevent us from getting to the steady state to the bad studies that even if we were in the lambda bigger than lambda star case. Um, um, in this model, we're not, con I guess we're not, we're not yet considering these cases, uh, partly because I think, you know, sometimes there's some credibility problem of why the user should believe that a platform is telling the truth, uh, whether people will be suspicious of the platform. But for now, we're looking at fairly simple um, design parameter of, of the platform. But I do agree that with uh, if you allow, you know, broader range of power for the platform that they're able to censor, they're able to fact check, uh, or they're able to send some kind of information on the basis of, you know, the stuff that's being uploaded to hint at the users what's the correct state, then they can presumably do more. Other questions? You're exactly one minute ahead of time, so I think that's a good place to stop. Please join me in thanking Kevin for a stimulating pitch. Our last word for this session, at the end of the session, is digital. We are adjourned until 4 p.m. where we'll come back for our last paper of the day. Okay. <laughs> Of course, yeah, don't worry, don't worry at all. All right, our first word for this session is lollipop. Rakesh, take it away. Well, we're very pleased to have Mushin Lee. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit shorter than I expect. <laughs> so really happy to present uh, the research I've been working on. Uh, my name is Mushin Lee, I'm from Bokani. So um, today I will talk about self-preferencing across markets. Um, so when I first started working on this project, it's motivated by some antitrust issue that uh, by company we are all familiar with, at least the two of them, Google and Amazon. We have to admit that uh, those dominant companies, they play a critical role in our daily life at least some data. Uh, each day, there are around 9 billion searches made on Google, uh, about 1.6 million packages shipped by Amazon. And regarding the market share in the European economic area, we call it EEA, Google's market share in search engine market is around 97 percentage point. In the US, it's a little bit lower but uh, still is approaching 90 percentage point. In the e-commerce market, I think without doubt, Amazon is the leading company, it's the largest one. The market share is around 38 percentage point, which is far higher than the largest competitor, Walmart, whose market share is less than seven percentage point. So there's such a huge difference between those dominant market or dominant companies market share and the largest competitor in the market. So that's the reason why when we look at a lot of economic literature, when we model those markets, we kind of mimic or use a monopoly to model it because basically it's, uh, it's monopoly. So if we think about which type of service they are providing, I think the role of Google, Amazon, they are more like a platform. Um, they provide intermediation service through which users from different groups connect with each other and they are able to interact with each other. For instance, Amazon connect buyers with sellers, Google connect advertisers with users who search for information. So, this is a such typical type of market. We call it multi-sided market. Basically, those companies, they work as a platform, an intermediation through which users from different groups, they are able <coughs> to interact with each other. And they gain value from those type of interaction. As a consequence, this will result in so-called positive networking effects meaning that with a large mass of users, those dominant companies have some comparative advantages. For instance, they have first-hand 
larger data set through which they are able to update their algorithm, they are able to make better recommendations. So indeed, when I checked a recent survey, I found that we trust those dominant companies. According to a recent survey, around 98% of the customer, they prefer Amazon's product recommendation. And indeed, when I work on this project, I found I'm one of them because Usually, how I purchase products through Amazon is that I search for the keyword, I go to the product page, and then I click the button of buy now. And when we do that, that is a buy box, and that means you will purchase this product from the recommended seller by Amazon. And according to some recent paper, they said about 80% of the transaction happens through buy box. For Google, it's the same. More than 80% of people, they trust the search results displayed on Google. On the one hand, I think it's a good thing because that means uh, their quality of service is good. So we are able to finish what we want through this platform quite efficiently. But on the other hand, what worries us is that what if those companies exploit our trust? What if they use their dominant market share in one market to gain competitive advantage in other markets? And they quickly grow in all layer of the supply chain or vertically integrated market. Indeed, if we look at Amazon and Google, they are quickly requiring and purchase and developing new country, a new new company in vertically integrated market. For instance, Alphabet, which is the owner of Google, they have the well-known search engine Google. They, have, they are operating YouTube, which is the largest uh, online platform for video sharing. But besides that, they also operate technology, like DB360 and uh, Ad Manager. Because if you think about YouTube, when publisher, they post the content on YouTube, they need to monetize those content. But now, in the digital age, they need to rely on some technology to do that, to interact with advertiser. So basically, Alphabet is also providing complementary service. For Amazon, similar story, when sellers go to Amazon and they want to finish the transaction with buyer, sellers also need to do the shipping. They need to manage the storage. And Amazon provides those type of service. They have Amazon Air, their distribution center. Also here I listed the whole food market, supermarket chain. So basically in this paper, what I am interested in is that a specific type of self-preferencing that is in some markets, there are some dominant form. It has a large market share and exploit its dominant market share and users trust that in one market to gain competitive advantage in other vertically integrated market. That's what I am working on in this project. And indeed, this phenomenon has already raised up some hated discussion and intervention, especially in Europe. So I hear at least some related regulation for instance, in December 2022, that is kind of the end of last year, the European Commission published the commitment on Amazon. And the main goal of this commitment is to reduce the self-preferencing of Amazon in logistics service. To make the story short, basically the European Commission found Amazon to buyer its recommendation towards seller who use Amazon shipping. And since almost 80% of transactions on Amazon happened through Amazon's recommendation. So when they buy a recommendation to seller who use their shipping, this mechanism basically leaves seller no alternative, but they have to use Amazon shipping. And that's the reason why in Europe, according to the EC, the market share of Amazon also in shipping increased rapidly. In Italy, similar regulations, so the Italian Competition Authority, I call it ICA, they impose fine on Amazon for the same reason, because of this type of self-preferencing. For Google, 
there's no intervention in Europe yet, but there has been an investigation since 2021. So for the Google case, it's a little bit different because Google was found to buy its own self practices, self preferencing towards its own ad ancillary technology. Because when the publisher and the advertiser, they need to interact and do the advertising, they need to hire some type of technology in order to do the auction. So basically, Google to found, was found to restrict the rivals' the quality. For instance, Google provides real data to its own technology, but for its rival, they only provide estimated information. And also, it only provides full interoperability between its own service, but for other service, a lot of functions you cannot use or compatible with Google. So in France, the competitive authority found Google for a similar reason, but they also placed some intervention in order to restore the competition in the technology market. So that's the background information. Based on this observation, here are three research questions I try to investigate through this project. The first one is that why? Why the platform is motivated do, to do that? Whether it is always profitable for the platform to practice this specific type of self-preferencing. If not, the under which condition or when is the platform motivated to do that? The second research question is that, what is the impact of this type of self-preferencing on the market, especially on the market competition in the ancillary product market and the welfare, whether users are better off, they are worse off because of this type of self-preferencing. The third question is about regulation. So if this type of self-preferencing is detrimental for the society, how can we regulate them? Is there any effective way for us to increase the competition, make users better off? So those are the three research questions I aim to answer through this paper. So how do I do that? Here is the outline of the paper and also the outline of today's talk. I begin with a very simple model. I call it benchmark because although this type of market is multi-sided market, I begin with some simplified assumption such that the platform is free for one group of user so we only focus on one side of market. For instance, Google is free for user to search for information. Amazon is free for buyer to use it. So we only look at the other side of market. And then based on this, I solve for the market equilibrium. What I am interested in is that if we allow the platform or we ask the platform to practice self-preferencing and to model it, I ask the platform to reduce users' value or users' utility if those users choose the rival's product and use it on the platform. Then I'm wondering what will happen. Then based on the analysis, I try to highlight on, shed light on the impact of self-preferencing on the market. So a natural question to ask next is that those results are based on theoretical finding, modeling. So whether this is what's happening in your own market. So to provide some evidence, empirical evidence, and I analyzed a recent intervention implemented in France in order to diminish Google's self-preferencing in ad technology market and I found a consistent data pattern as the theoretical prediction. And besides that, I also discussed some policy implica imp implication based on the model. For instance, I analyze what will happen if, as suggested in the EC's proposal, that is, we uh, ask the monopoly platform to help its rival increase their product quality with a fair price. For instance, in the DMA, they ask Google to share the data with the competitor, but the competitor need to pay Google a fair price. Also, I analyzed a proposal by the EC in the recent uh, published uh, objective statement 
such that what if re requires those dominant company to have a mandatory divestment, what will happen? And lastly, I do some robust check and uh, give you the conclusion. But due to the time restriction, because I was first informed it's a 20 minutes talk, so at first I was planning to skip the policy implication, robust check, and go directly to conclusion. But let's see. So for the model part, this is a picture where I want to show you the type of market I have in mind when I create this model. Basically, the market I'm interested in is something like this. There are two group of user. I call it the group A and group B. So those users, they are in the market and they try to interact with each other. For instance, you can look group A as seller, group B as buyer on Amazon. And in order to finish the transaction or interaction with the other group, they have to go through some intermediation or they need to go through some platform. So there's a monopoly platform, I call it Form Zero. It is the only platform through which those two forms can interact with each other and this form provides intermediation service. However, in addition to the intermediation service, one group of users, they also need to purchase some additional ancillary product. For instance, Seller on Amazon, they have to purchase shipping. All advertisers posting on Google, they need to hire some technology to manage their and optimize their budget. Although this type of intermediation service is monopolized by Form Zero, there is competition in the ancillary product market. To model that, I assume this ancillary product is also provided by the platform itself, that is Form Zero. And correspondingly, I call this product the first party product. At the same time, it is also provided by a competing form. I call it Form One. And correspondingly, this product is third party ancillary product. Okay? And for the monopoly platform, its profit come from two sources. One is it come from the profits of selling intermediation service, and also it come from the ancillary product market. However, for the competing form, its profit only come from third party product selling. So that's the market structure I have in mind when I work on this model. And the game is as follows. It's a simple game. First, the monopoly platform sets the platform fee. I use MA to denote it. And this is a fee based on which user in group A decide whether to join the market. So in the benchmark, in order to make everything simple, I assume the platform is free for group B user so we only focus on the group A, who have to purchase both the intermediation service and the ancillary product. And user join the market, and two form simultaneously determine the price of ancillary products. Users in group A then compare the price, the product value. They will just choose the one that provides them the highest utility. That's a game. So, Basically, the utility takes the following format. A user after joining the market, you will be randomly assigned a location on a hotel in line like this. And the location is a representative of its taste. And if it purchased a product from form I, then its utility consists of two components. So the first component is the value it obtained from using the intermediation service. It equals E, which is the networking effect. That is value it obtained by interacting with each user from the other group. NB is the number of uh, user in group B. So there are more buyers, for example, if there are more buyers on Amazon, sellers are better off minus MA, that is the price charged by the platform for its intermediation service. This is the first part of the value. 
that the user will get if they join the market. And it is the same across all users, no matter which type of ancillary product it choose. The second part varies, and it depends on the user's choice of ancillary product. It equals fi, which is the product value of form i, minus the price of the ancillary product from form i, minus t, which is a parameter we call a transportation cost. Basically, it measures the similarity of the two ancillary products in the market. So when t increase, that means there is a larger cost for the user to travel from this point to the other point. So those two products become more differentiated times the user's location minus the product location. So this is the part of util this utility that the user incur if they need to travel to those uh, forms location. Or you can understand it as the difference between its ideal product and the product offered in the market. So this is the utility setup. I will skip the technical session. So basically I solve for the platform and forms optimal pricing strategy. I'm able to know what are the demand at equilibrium. Now what we are interested in is that what will happen if we ask the platform to practice self-preference? So how do we model that? Basically, I'm checking how the market involved if Form Zero, that is a monopoly platform, it restricts the user's utility using this platform and if they choose the third party ancillary product. So basically, if you still recall, F1 is the value of the user if they use third party ancillary product. And I'm checking, I'm doing comparative st statistic of F1, and I'm wondering how the market change if the value of F1 decreases. Here are the main results. So let us first look at the ancillary product market. So I find that if there's a reduction in user's value of using third party products, that is there's a reduction in F1, if we only look at the ancillary product, it seems that the monopoly platform is better off. Why? It is because, first of all, this allows the monopoly platform to charge a higher price for the first party ancillary product. In addition, even if it is sold at a higher price, more users will be attracted to this first party product in the ancillary product market, which is kind of intuitive because basically, if the platform restricts the user's value of using rival's product, then what will happen is that that will make the platform's own product better off. So they are able to charge a higher price and more users will choose their product. And for the competing form, it's always worse off. First, they have to reduce the price they charge for their product. And even if they, they, they sell their product at the lower price, fewer people will choose them. So their market share will keep decreasing and the market share for the first party product and ancillary product keep increasing, which is quite consistent with what we observe in the real market. And that is why the EC or the Comp Computational Authority worries about. However, the interesting part is that if we look at the whole picture, we extend to the market of intermediation service there's a conflict in impact emerge in this process. That is, although the monopoly platform is better off by selling a higher first party ancillary product at a higher price with a higher demand, it has to reduce its platform fee. Why it is the case? So if we still continue using Amazon as an example, basically what Amazon is doing is that seller in order to interact with buyer, they have to use Amazon shipping. And we know that as a result, Amazon are able to increase the shipping price and more users have no choice, but they need to use Amazon shipping in order to interact with buyer.
But one consequence of this is that it's less profitable for seller to join the market. Because for each transaction, Amazon extracts more value by selling shipping. As a consequence, you since Amazon's profit depends heavily on user participation, in order to cancel out or reduce this negative effect, Amazon have to reduce the price of intermediation service. And that's how the conflict effect emerged through this process. So basically, if we summarize what's happening regarding the demand and the price, we know that for the competing form, it's always worse off. Because basically, if the platform practice self-preferencing in a junk market or a related market, the competing form, they have to reduce the price. They, have, they obtain smaller demand. As a consequence, the profit always decreases because of this. But if we look at the monopoly platform, it re receives a higher profit in ancillary product, but for the intermediation fee, it could be lower. So, so can yes. I ask about this? I mean, I don't know if it's different in Italy, but in the US, it looks to me like Amazon is actually not making all that money, all, all, much, all that much money from the shipping and handling, the fulfillment side. Like the margins there seem much smaller than the you know, the referral fees, which are like on the order of 15% on, on, on the stuff that is actually sold. And I, I always thought that the reasoning for them offering this fulfillment service so cheap was a way to lock people in on their platform. So they would, you know, have their stuff in Amazon warehouses. And so now they couldn't go off and sell on other platforms. But that would sort of be the reverse of this, where the, you know, the shipping and handling fee would be small and, and it's the platform fees, which are these referral fees that would end up being high. So like, do you have a sense of how much of the Amazon revenue is coming from the fulfillment services versus the, versus the referral fees? I actually, I do not have a data for that, but um, I think for the, the document circulated for the Italian case regarding Amazon, I think the one argument, at least one argument why Amazon can charge like Know, like a low shipping fee people think is a the demand is too large so they are because of economy of skill they are able to charge a price you think is low right but I mean as an economist I guess we would think that that's that's a great thing they're very efficient <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know they, exactly. they can do the shipping so, so I, I so. will show you actually self-preferencing is beneficial for the welfare under some condition yeah, yeah. yes but here's the other thing I would say about this is I have a much more cynical response, mm -hmm. which is this traditional understanding of the European package market is they're all monopolized by traditional post PTTs and that they haven't liberalized the package service at all. And so what you could see this is a rent evasion move is you self provision so you don't have to rely on this overpriced service that they're you basically every post office in the world except for the US generally doesn't allow competition in packages use the profits from that to fund first class mail and the death of first class mail. And so when you, you could see a very different political economy story here altogether and yes. be driving this. So actually here I'm not comparing the price for Amazon shipping and the competitor shipping. What I'm saying is that because of the self-preferencing, here is the pattern. Amazon shipping, they become more and more expensive when they get more and more market share, and you will decrease the price of competitor shipping. But I, I guess another way to phrase my concern is that to me it looks like the, that there's another antitrust concern which has to do with I'm going to give you this fulfillment service very uh, at a low price so that you're locked in with my warehouse system and that prevents you from going to Walmart yes so, yes. so that this is this is my way to limit competition between platforms yes actually uh, there are several paper I think Amazon it could use this as a strategy to lock in people. And yeah. also, it, you can build it to some extent as a way for them to subsidize buyer. Because basically, it's, it's not that easy or illegal to give a user money to join the market. But I think there are some paper in economics that actually show that when they bundle some product, uh, and uh, basically, they are become a, a legal way for them to attract more user and subsidize buyers. But this is not the focus of the, this paper. So what I'm interested in is that if they reduce and limit the value of uh, competitors' uh, product value, what will happen? Yes. Can I ask another question? Yes. 
So, you motivate the paper around network effects, but I didn't see a network size argument in your paper. Yes. It, and if it's so not, far. This, this always feels like a tying paper to me, yeah. as opposed to a network effects paper. Is, am I missing something? Yes. So in the benchmark, like I said, I begin with a simplified model that there's uh, one side of the market, the participation is fixed. And, but in the paper, I extend to a two-sided market. So there exists a section where I extend and include the network effect. And indeed, I allow the platform to use parsing strategy to endogenous the participation. The result are quite consistent. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Quick, just clarifying question. Sure. Uh, you've been uh, discussing the first and third party products as shipping, but the discussion of warehouses is uh, uh, really important, I think, for Amazon. And I just want, in, as a particular example, I want to make sure I understand. Uh, in Amazon's case, uh, in both the EU and in uh, US uh, current uh, or probably upcoming litigation, uh, a big issue is the seller fulfilled prime uh, mm -hmm. product. Mm -hmm. And with that service, uh, the sellers are able to warehouse their own products and handle the shipping. Yes. Um, so when you're referring to third-party shipping, mm -hmm. are you referring to the sellers warehousing and shipping their own products or the sellers contracting out with a third party other than Amazon to handle fulfillment? I think yeah, for the modeling aspect, what I have, what I have in mind is more like they are choosing competitors. They are choosing a different company to do the shipping. Um, I'm not sure whether sellers shipping on their own will affect, like affect the conclusion because basically, third party products could represent any alternative besides uh, Amazon shipping. Oh, yes. So I, I think I'm not certain, but I think that it will matter for the paper which it is mm -hmm. because if the party is deciding, if the seller is deciding whether merely to use Amazon as the marketplace and mm -hmm. uh, pay the, the listing fees and all that stuff, then they handle all the shipping. That's a different business, I think, and a different set of transactions than if they are doing that and then deciding whether to uh, use fulfillment by Amazon or contract out to a separate third party for shipping. I think uh, uh, one aspect I know that uh, will resolve the difference is that a seller, if they choose to do their own shipping, Amazon, they have some standard. Mm -hmm. As long as you meet that standard, you will have the same benefit as uh, shipping by Amazon. But I think so far, according to the existing paper economics, uh, all of us agree that the standard set by Amazon is extremely high. Yep. So almost no one can hit that uh, standard. So, so basically there's a huge difference be still between whether you choose Amazon shipping and other alternatives. Yes. So this is uh, the product demand and uh, uh, price. As I illustrated in the previous slides, for, for the platform, there are conflicting impacts. So they earn more money for the ancillary product, but they have to reduce uh, the price of intermediation and service. So the conclusion, first conclusion is that it's not always optimal for the platform to practice self-preferencing. So basically, um, for the monopoly platform, it will achieve a higher profit only when the T is sufficiently small. And if you refer T is a measurement of product similarity, and if I translate this conclusion of Larry is that only when the two products, the ancillary product, the market are sufficiently similar. So there is a strong competition in ancillary product it is optimal for the monopoly platform to practice self-preferencing. Otherwise, it's not profitable for them to do that. As for the competing form, its profit always decreases because of self-preferencing, because the lower price and lower demand. This is a striking and surprising result, I find, in this paper. That is, even users are not necessarily worse off. So I find that if there's a reduction in users' value of using third-party products, the demand for the platform participation actually will increase if there's a strong competition in a product market. 
But if we combine this result with the previous uh, slides, what I'm finding in this uh, modeling is that when the platform is motivated to practice self-preferencing and the market is sufficiently competitive in a savory product market, then users are better off. So they are able to gain more value, more people are, will be attracted to join the market, to interact with the other group. This corresponds to the question before that whether users are better off, it could be. So it's a little bit counterintuitive at the first glance, but if we think about what's happening, it's not that hard to understand. So what the, the funny suggest is that if the transportation cost is low, users are better off because of self-preferencing. This is due to the fact that, that if there's a high product similarity between first party product and third party product, then when the platform practices self-preferencing and it reduces the third party product value, this could induce a significant sh shift of user from the rival company to the monopoly platform. And what does that mean? That means it becomes more profitable for the platform to attract additional user to the market. Because there's a high chance those user will choose is also its own shipping, so they're able to extract more profit from the user. As a consequence, this corresponds to a stronger motivation for the platform to reduce the intermediation fee and attract the user to join the market. Since there are more users join the market, it becomes better off. It's beneficial for them. So a natural question to ask next is that whether it is true, because this is based on the model setup and based on some assumption. So based on this benchmark, I extend to the two-sided market. The only difference is that now I allow the platform to charge platform fee on both sides of market, so the demand for both group, group become endogenous. The results and conclusion are quite consistent. The only difference is that the, when the transportation cost is low, so when two products are sufficiently similar and there's strong competition, both users in both group are better off. So not only one group user become better off, if they have positive networking effect, both group become better off. So to test whether it is true, I'm analyzing a recent intervention implemented in France regarding Google self-preferencing. So here is some background information. Basically, Google is dominant at almost all level of online advertising supply chain. And so this intervention focused specifically on the, the technology for the publisher. So basically for publisher, if they post on Google, post on YouTube, they want to monetize their content. And in order to do that, they need to basically use two types of technology. One is called ad server. So basically they check the, um, the stock of the impression. Also they allow the publisher to post advertising. Another one is technology called SSP, that is supply side platform. This is the platform where the, uh, the publisher collects the bids, auction bids from advertiser and they do the exchange of information and do the auction. So in France, according to the investigation, they found that Google practice uh, self-preferencing between those two types of technology. Basically, here are at least some way for Google to do it. First, it offers real-time bids information to its own product, own technology. But for the rivals company, they only offer estimated information, and it's not real-time. And secondly, they have some additional information provided to its own technology. For instance, the minimum bid to win information, which represent one type of information important for those technology companies in order to optimize their service. 
Also, they limit the interability between Google service with rival service. So in this paper, I analyze a specific commitment implemented by FCA, that is, by June 2022, they asked Google to grant rival the same auction data access as its own product. Since the technology of ad auction depends heavily on information, so when Google was requested to share the information with rival, I think it's reasonable to say that it will improve the quality of rival's product and reduce the magnitude of self-preferencing. And according to the theoretical prediction, what we expect to observe are the following two things. First is that advertiser, which is the group of user in the market, it would be worse off and you will become fewer advertisers join the market afterwards. On the publisher side, even if we extend to the two-sided market, it's also worse off. So the data I'm using, I'm using a data set from Simner Web. It provides the traffic data. So Wait, hold on. Could, could you put up that hypothesis two again, please? Yes. So the first hypothesis indicates that the intervention requesting Google to share more data with competing ad technology will make advertisers better off. So I expect to see there's a reduction in number of advertisers join the market. The second hypothesis is that the intervention, which also implemented by the FCA, it will reduce, it will make the publisher side also worse off. They reduce the user surplus on publisher side. And how to measure that? I, I check the advertising revenue collected by it. So, so, so hypothesis two is puzzling to me. So I have the following yes. story in my head. Mm -hmm. So I am the publisher. Mm -hmm. I have an opportunity cost of selling you the space to advertise on. Mm -hmm. um, in a world where, where you and the competing bidder both know that opportunity cost, yes. I would get Bertrand competition mm -hmm. and you would pay me my opportunity cost, right? It's, I think it's determined by auction mechanism, right? right. So, so in other basically, words, I will accept any bid that is above my opportunity cost. But the problem is that now it's not the market that you communicate or interact with advertiser. Publisher need to pay Google for this type of technology. I see. Right? So what the conclusion based on theoretical model is that because of self, when they reduce the self-preferencing, Google actually will increase the price of some technology so this will reduce the revenue they receive yes and, and yes. doesn't like the sharing of information with competitors like waste any collusion risk uh, I actually that's a very good question but uh, i'm not certain i need to think about it but i don't think they have a collusion issue because basically when they share data about auction is it's like you have more larger data set it will just increase the accuracy of the algorithm it's yeah, but yeah you know more like you have more but you do not know who is uh, doing the auction no so i assume this will just increase the quality of this technology because for the publisher side what they do is that if they, I have more accurate uh, uh, information regarding auction, I could uh, make a better uh, strategy regarding bidding for the, uh, for the ad, uh, for the impression. But I will think about it, it's a very good question. Maybe because it's the last paper, I'm just, for the day, I'm just missing something. Could you explain to me the mechanism of why hypothesis one, the, number of advertisers declined? We're, not, we're talking about the number of advertisers, not the activity levels, you know, not prices, not quantities. Yes. What is it, why is it the number of advertisers reducing? Yes. So basically, our theoretical prediction, one important thing is that if the platform is motivated to practice self-preferencing, 
users are better off. There are more people join the market. So here, when we look at this specific case, is ad technology market. So the user become advertiser, right? One group of user. And we know that self-preferencing will attract an increased number of users, and when they implement the, the intervention, they reduce the self-preferencing magnitude. And correspondingly, the number of users should move to the opposite direction. It should decrease. But you're assuming because self-preferencing is superior, it's providing efficiency benefits, and that's what causes more to come in and blocking them from doing it reduces the number of users? Is this a bad assumption? Can you... So if information sharing would allow competitors to compete on advertising, you know, intermediation, intermediation services better. Yes. And if that lowered prices, I would expect the number of users to go up. Unless self-preferencing uh, firm zero is actually better at doing the, inter um, doing the advertising services on an integrated basis, in which then I would extend, expect the users to go down. Yes, if you only think about the performance, that's the case, but uh, now we assume there's a price for the advertiser, for the publisher to pay this type of technology. So when the self-preferencing, they, they when the intervention is implemented, self-preferencing magnitude increase, uh, decrease. Correspondingly, that will affect the pricing strategy of this technology, and this will result in a decrease in the participation, not the performance. Yes. So basically, how much time I have? Yes. So let me show you the data pattern. I hope this could convince you. So basically, what I'm checking on the left side is the number of uh, advertisers uh, in the European economic area. And uh, I have the data for one year, weekly data for one year. And this black dot are the number of advertisers posting on the most popular website in each country. And the black dot are the France, which is a treaty country where the intervention was implemented. And the blue rectangle are the average number of advertisers joining the rest of the country in EA. And this dashed line corresponds to the time when the implementation, uh, the intervention was implemented. So Google was requested to share the data with the uh, other company. You see the data pattern is quite clear. Basically in France, the number of advertisers decrease a lot when they ask Google to share the data with the competitor, which is exactly as predicted by the theoretical model. And on the right side, I look at the publisher advertising revenue. Same, I use the black dot to denote the France case. And the blue rectangle, uh, triangle are the rest of country, I call it control group. Both of them decrease, but clearly there is a larger drop in the advertising revenue in France after Google was requested to share the data with its rivals. Yes? I don't know if you mentioned, but where is this data coming from? Yes, I will go back because uh, I try to... Yes. So basically, this is the data I'm using. Uh, I basically use two data sources. The first one is similar web, and basically I use their list of most popular websites, top 50 most popular websites in the EEA states. And this determines the sample, and then I also use a data set called Ad Clarity. So this data set allows me to collect the two things I'm interested in. One is the number of advertiser in each week posting on those websites and bid for the impression or no, auction no, of no. advertising. The other is advertising revenue or publisher. And do you know the data generating process of ad clarity? Because your data is showing that the number of advertisers drops to one third mm -hmm. roughly. Yes. Which I find kind of hard to believe. Mm. So I'm well, wondering I think if there is any bias in the data generating process that could drive the result. You think the data is not that accurate? Or okay. maybe it's it's not covering. So I, I'm thinking if there could be some substitution going on rather than the advertiser just yes. appearing because it so, goes from 600 to 200. 
Yes, so basically what I did is that for robustness check, uh, I used different sample. This one I use uh, top uh, 50. Uh, I also check what are the most popular websites for all EA country. The result uh, the same, very similar. And also another uh, thing I did is that I distinguish the URL or the publisher between publisher or advertiser. Because for example, for some websites, specific type or category of websites, they rely more heavily on advertising. For example, media and news. We got exactly similar results. But for the data accuracy, that's the part that is out of our control. That's the best data I'm able to get regarding this uh, type of empirical evidence. Yes. So, I will jump directly to the conclusion because I won't have 10 minutes left. Uh, and you, if there are no more questions, you want me to talk about policy implication, I'm more than happy to talk more. But um, I did not find the mouse, but uh, let me conclude. So in this paper... It's in the drawer right there. Slide the drawer. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. yes, thank you. So basically in this paper, I try to create a tractable and a simple model in order to incorporate the characteristic of a specific type of self-preferencing. That is, there exists a monopoly platform which is dominant in market, but it practices self-preferencing in another related market, vertical integrated market, by reducing or limiting the value of user if they choose rival's product. I'm wondering what will happen. Based on this, I found that it's not always optimal for the monopoly platform to practice this type of self-preferencing. It's only optimal for them to do that if this monopoly platform faces strong competition in the ancillary product market. There's a high similarity for the user regarding the first party product provided by the platform and the third party product provided by the rival form. I also find that although this type of self-preferencing always generates detrimental effects on the competing form, it can potentially benefit user. And indeed, when I check a recent implementation of, uh, by in France regarding Google self-preferencing, I find a quite consistent pattern. So the number of advertiser and publish revenue actually decrease after the, the implementation of intervention, which is supposed to reduce self-preferencing in ad technology market. So I hope that through this paper, we have a better understanding about the underlying mechanism. Also, I find that the impact of different type of intervention varies a lot depending on different type of intervention design. So I hope this paper could serve as a reminder for policymaker to be cautious in their intervention design. So that's basically what I have for this paper. I'm happy to answer more questions you have. Yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, my question is, uh, my understanding is that you found some positive like, effects uh, for consumers and very negative effects for rivals. Yes. So what would be your solution to ban self-preferencing? Yes. What would so actually, I find uh, one potential case. Oh, I analyzed uh, some uh, policy implication. So one thing that, uh, especially for Google, one thing which has been under discussion is uh, whether we should ask Google to share the data with the rival. Mm -hmm. So because especially the advertising technology rely heavily on the access of data. So there are some proposals such that what if we ask Google to share the data, but it's not for free. We ask uh, the competing form to pay Google some fair price in order to get their data. To translate that in our model, basically what's happening is that we ask the monopoly platform to help the rival to increase their product value, but with a fixed price. So based on the model, what's happening are the following. Basically, there are two cases. If the transportation cost is very high, 
Then the monopoly platform, if the increased value of the competitor is always better off. And also now they receive money by selling their data, they're always better off. For the competing form, since they, they have a higher value in their products, they're always better off, but now they also need to pay a price. I use capital R to denote the price. As long as it's not that expensive, they're also better off. For user, it's always better off. But this case is a less interesting case because if you remember, the platform is only motivated to practice self-preferencing when T is sufficiently small. So this, I think, is a more interesting case. So in this, in, in this specific case, it's more restrictive about the intervention design. First, uh, in this case, the price of this type of intervention or help the rival to increase the quality should not be too low. So if it is too low, since in this case, the monopoly platform becomes worse off, you need to pay a price sufficiently high in order to cover this cost, so it becomes better off. For the competing form, it cannot be too high, because I am paying to improve my product quality, although I derive higher profits. And because of this, if you charge me a large bill, I'm not willing to use this type of intervention. So these are the kind of restrictions for the price that they should implement. But on the user side, it's a little bit tricky because so far I did not see any intervention that talk about the user side. And we know that if they reduce the self-preferency, users are worse off. So it will decrease. But one thing that come to my mind is that what if we introduce additional dimension that is we subtract some part of the price to subsidize user. Whether it is possible that everyone is better off. So here I just make a specific example, which is very simple that if the transportation cost, in this case, just to simplify the equation, here is the example that at this specific value, everyone is better off. And the restrictions are First, the price of the um, the price for the monopoly platform to help the rival to improve their quality should be not too high, and the subsidy should be sufficiently high to cover the loss of user. And I list some example. In this case, user derived the same value of uh, before, say, uh, exactly the same user surplus. So they have the subsidy to subsidize the decrease in self-preferencing. And this value is an example of the price where both forms are willing to accept the price they are better off. So this is a strategy that I have in mind. And according to the model, everyone is better off. Yes. Yes. So let me tell the self-preferencing story in a different way, and then you tell me what I'm missing, <laughs> which is, let's suppose I start by, um, uh, with self-preferencing of, let's say, my transportation services. Uh -huh. Then I'm like a monopolist offering a two-part tariff. Mm -hmm. There is a membership fee, and then there is a price per unit for shipping, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. You enter with competing shipping services at a lower price than me. I shouldn't care because all I have to do is allow my customers to choose you, but just raise my membership. So, so if I think of it that way, it seems to me I never have to worry about self-preferencing. Mm -hmm. if, if a better transportation competitor comes in, I just raise my membership fee. But the problem is that if your membership fee is too high, fewer people will go to the platform. You get. Uh... No, I, I agree. So there's some upper limit, but the point is, whatever additional surplus that the better competitor on transportation can generate, I can capture some of it by raising my membership. Yes. A little yes. Bit, right? I agree. And, and so the point is, I don't have to do self-preferencing. 
So your, your argument is that if uh, the rival's product quality is too low, no one will choose no. them? Yeah, so if, if the rival's product quality is too low, nobody chooses yes. them. And if it's better than mine, fantastic, choose them. You're getting more surplus, but I'll capture it with a higher membership fee. Mm. Yes, I agree with you. That makes sense to me. So basically, you are saying that if uh, if the quality of rival is uh, sufficiently high, then I just uh, charge uh, the membership. But still, I there's an upper limit. It's basically right. If, right. Yes. There is an upper limit. So I, I, I guess so. If you buy that story, then. I, I'm left with the puzzle of, yes. of so why do they sell preference? Yes. <laughs> and why is so it? <laughs> one assumption I make, actually, I should emphasize uh, for the model setup is I assume the product value of first party product is always higher than the third party product in this model. But there's a, don't you have another answer, which is I think back to the original Walter Oy two part pricing article. Mm -hmm. if Preferences are hetero, if preferences are homogeneous, simple two-part pricing works great, works perfectly efficiently. The secondary case is if there's heterogeneity, and that's what she's starting to build in her model on the hoteling side, then a simple price on the, um, simple two-part pricing isn't always extractive. And then you might have an example. Right, so, so, okay. So the, the <laughs> setting the high fixed fee and the, price of the, the, and the price of the consumer with marginal cost is no longer optimal. There is some other combination that is optimal, but the point is, if you come in and can undercut me on the consumable, I don't care. I can just raise my fixed fee a little bit. The problem is always there's upper limits. For example, if uh, you have a very high, high quality and you charge a uh, very high price, everyone chooses the rival's product, and then there's no additional surplus I can extract uh, through the intermediation service that will make uh, my profit hurt because there's always an upper limit of uh, your willingness to pay in order to join the market, no? No, no, that, that's a separate issue. My, my point is whatever profit that is going to the rival, I can capture through a higher fixed fee. You so cannot, you... So I think now, only you're, you're if you right, you there's can... a concern with that the sellers may stop coming to me. Um, and but that's a limit that I face anyway, right? So I agree with you if you can. So I think the logic apply for a different type of self preferencing that is I could extract the profit from the rival. Like Amazon, they sell their own products and they also allow third party to sell and they charge third party uh, commission fee. So basically, I have additional channel to extract the profit from you. But this case is a little bit different because even if FedEx do shipping on Amazon, Amazon cannot request FedEx to pay the platform. No, no, but I don't have to ask FedEx, right? My, the people, the sellers who are coming to my platform, I just say the fee is higher. Then this a furious transaction. No, no, because they can still use FedEx. But uh, FedEx, uh, the transaction or the order FedEx is affected by the number of transactions happen on Amazon. If like there are no people doing transaction, the FedEx profit always decreases, no? Because what we are thinking is that there's a monopoly market. Right. So they have to go through Amazon oh, in I, order I, to I, do I the transaction. So FedEx has to lower it. So, yes. so FedEx has to respond by lowering its price and then we, say <coughs> we don't want to participate on Amazon. Yes. <coughs> but it's not, so yes, that's a possibility, but it's, again, it's not immediate. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, we're at the time, so I mean, yeah. and I, I have a question too, which is the other standard response you see in these setups is these market structures that make these possible also are, tend to be um, we get efficiencies from eliminating double marginalization, mm -hmm. which can be another question about benefits. But we'll have to discuss that over dinner. Sure, <laughs> happy to. Anyway, please join me in thanking. Well, it's been a very full day, but I think a very fruitful one. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, it's been tremendously satisfying for me. Uh, we're very proud of CTIC to be part of this, and thank you all for being uh, for participating because it wouldn't be pot it wouldn't be nearly as meaningful without 
not only the authors and the excellent work you've done, but the participants of all of us here in the questions and the discussion that followed. Uh, Prakash? Thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs> uh, we appreciate it all deeply, and uh, we look forward to We have a, 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 you can sign up for our mailing list. We have a, events of different kinds throughout the entire year. The Warren Center sponsors events throughout the year. We encourage you to stay engaged with us, and we'll continue to do these things. You wait for that. Yeah. Final word. Final word. <laughs> oh. Professor. <laughs> uh, how appropriate. Anyway, uh, thank you all, and we hope to see you at a future event. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.